I've been investigating claims of paranormal activity for years, and I've seen a lot of scary things, but nothing compares to what we saw that night at that haunted penitentiary. It made me question everything, everything that I thought I knew, everything that I thought I had learned. And I think we made a mistake that night and opened up a dark doorway. The experiment definitely went wrong. Hi, I'm Jenny. I'm a tour guide here at Missouri State Penitentiary. And first, thanks for coming um, and visiting us. We not only used brutally violent physical torture, uh, but also mental torture as well. And we were very good at both. Killings were almost daily, if not weekly. So the violence and bloodshed in this building was just off the charts. Down here, things can get different. So be on your guard. 95% of us won't come down here by ourselves. Tonight on The Paranormal Files, we're at the Missouri State Penitentiary. Could you walk over to that one and touch it maybe? Oh! Oh, oh. Using these costumes, these outfits, might bring out some of the energy. Oh, oh, what the f was that? Jesus, what are you doing, man? Tonight on The Paranormal Files, we're at the bloodiest prison in the history of America, the Missouri State Penitentiary. This prison is notorious for the thousands of deaths that happened on property. This place saw everything from murderers to people that took their own lives, guards who killed prisoners, and obviously the infamous gas chamber where over 40 people were executed by the state of Missouri. Already during our tour, we've experienced some of our strongest paranormal activity we've ever seen in a prison. I'm talking about loud doors slamming with our tour guide, confirmed by a police officer. You are honestly going to be shocked by what we're about to show you. So join us tonight as we explore the history and hauntings of this notorious prison. Head down with me right now into the dungeon where tons of inmates died, and welcome to the Paranormal Files. As we're getting closer to Halloween, who doesn't like a good ghost story? Just a quick drive north of our Ozarks life, we have what many consider is the most haunted place in the state, and a visit to the Missouri State Penitentiary in Jefferson City is quite the experience. At the center of the state sits a petrifying penitentiary. 1836, you know, the same week that the Alamo fell, this place opened up. When we first became a prison, Texas, Arizona, New Mexico, Nevada, California, all of that was Mexico. From 1836 to 2004, the worst of the worst wasted their time at the Missouri State Penitentiary. I've seen three different episodes of Gunsmoke, and they've talked about Jeff City getting out of the penitentiary and they're talking about this place. Over the years, more housing units were added to accommodate the career gangsters, racists, and cold-blooded killers. Before it closed, it was the oldest operating penal facility west of the Mississippi River. We had Sonny Liston in this building. We had James Earl Ray, Pretty Boy Floyd over in the other building. But not every inmate left. 40 were executed on site, one by lethal injection, and before that, 39 inside of this gas chamber, including a man from the Ozarks. Wright County's Ernest Afton Scott. In the spring of 1948, he shot his wife Verla in front of their oldest of seven kids because she filed for divorce. He also killed the judge in Mountain Grove that was going to hold their hearing. A year later, the last thing he saw was the inside of this chamber. 20 cyanide tablets were set on the little shelf underneath. When they pulled the red lever, that dropped that into a stone crock that had acid in it, which actually created a visible cyanide mist. And they told him, now, when that gets up around your throat, because they can't see it coming up, we'll tap on the glass, bum, 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 let you know, and then you can either hold your breath or take a long, you know, take a deep breath. It's like breathing battery acid, and it just burns, and, and you can't draw another breath, and you just slowly suffocate. So it's horrible, like 
horrible way to kill anybody. Outside of the execution chamber, hundreds of deaths have been reported at this prison. A lot of murders were committed in here, some very bloody and violent murders. In 1967, Time Magazine called it the bloodiest 47 acres in America. Former corrections officer and Crocker native Tom Wells can attest to that. I've seen inmates stabbed 25 times, blood squirting out of them everywhere, running to the hospital, and you know, I've seen guys, you know, I've seen a guy out in the gym that had been murdered. These buildings were like fortresses to keep Missouri's worst from escaping. Today, many believe some of these inmates still cannot leave. Voices, footsteps, and shadows are said to watch your every move. Before our investigation begins, as we're getting our interviews, we do phasma box, static boxes. We get a. Um, um, Somebody was walking up there. Yeah, it could, it could be. And it appears like something was walking and watching us from a level above inside of Building Three. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. Yeah. It happens when it happens. All right, guys, we are currently driving up right now to the Missouri State Penitentiary. I know y'all online love, whoa, whoa, <laughs> hold up, hold up. I know you guys online love when we visit prisons. This prison, I have to tell you guys, has the most disturbing history of any prison we've ever filmed in. This is a place where we have access to the death chambers. We've never had that before in the history of our show. Uh, the gas chambers where 40 people died. So, Jeez. yeah, I've heard this place is really dark, it's violently haunted, and it is a very evil haunting, so... This will be my first big prison video. So. Yeah, your first ever, man. So I'm really excited about that. I've done several prisons. They're all unique. And they're always this dark. One, this one seems to be extra dark. Yeah, every All time we do a prison, it, you know? someone gets attacked, someone gets punched, and someone gets are. slapped. Oh, Holy shit. fuck. Mm. Well, this is just the beginning, man. This is called, nicknamed the bloodiest 47 acres for the amount of insane bloodshed that occurred here. Average Tuesday night, am hey, I right? At least this is why we're going to prison. Yeah, this is. we could be going to prison for a lot of other reasons. A lot of, a lot of other people yeah. go to prison, it's right. not as fun. I'm yeah, gonna, this the is the day. only reason I'm going to prison. Oh yeah. my dude, being here is giving me the wow, chills, look man. That. Look, look at that how f***ing big this is. Sure. Dude, look at how f***ing oh, big it is. Gigantic, oh my god, bro. We can each have our Let's own see. building tonight. Alright boys, okay. I think we got our work cut out for us. Wow. I think so. Oh my god. I think it's time we oh. go to prison. Let's go to prison. Let's go to prison. Let's go to prison. <laughs> Make sure to like the video and leave us a comment, by the yeah. way. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. If you support us going to prison. <laughs> <laughs> if you want us to go to prison, like, share, comment, <laughs> true. Okay. Also, let us know in the comments, who do you think would last the longest in prison? Oh, of course. Definitely that'd, me. That'd be me. <laughs> Come on, dude. I'm just taking enough. myself out of that. I'm fucking dead. <laughs> So I've always wanted to visit the Missouri State Penitentiary. Now, back when I just started my channel before I had the money to even rent a hotel room to investigate, I visited the penitentiary and took a look around and was like, man, I could not believe how big it was, how creepy it seemed. And it was one of my wishes to visit this location. So I finally got to pay to visit and rent it out for the night. I cannot thank you all enough online for making that possible, an old dream of mine come true. I mean, this place is truly wild. We've done so many prisons in the last year and a half or so, and this place seemed to be the worst of the worst. I mean, so many murders, so many deaths, so much brutality, serial killers, rapists, everything bad uh, about society. It was all right there in the prison. And this is a first here on the channel this location actually contained the death chambers for the state of Missouri, so 40 people were executed there. I've never gotten to investigate a place like that, and yeah, all I can say is I wasn't let down. So this is my first location that I've ever done that is just a prison. From the day that it was built to the day that it shut down, it's only been a penitentiary. This place is absolutely insane. <laughs> I had never experienced anything like this. We were about to find out why this place is so, so haunted. I was excited. So at this point it was time to do the tour of the Missouri State Penitentiary grounds. And I'm gonna warn you all before this tour, it is very graphic. There are some dark, disturbing details we're gonna go over with our guide. And if you have a weak stomach, 
I would definitely recommend maybe skipping ahead through some of those parts because this history is brutal. And we want to tell you everything that happened there so you can understand fully why this place might be so damn haunted. Hi, I'm Jenny. I'm a tour guide here at Missouri State Penitentiary. And first, thanks for coming um, and visiting us. Um, I'm going to give you a little background before we get started. I have lived here all of my life. I never worked at the facility. But I'm kind of ashamed to admit I really didn't know much about the prison, even having it right here, literally in our back or front yard, so to speak, until I became a tour guide. And then I kind of became obsessed, as we all do. Uh, we opened our doors here and took our first inmate in March of 1836. That was 45 years before the light bulb was invented. Andrew Jackson was president at the time, and the Battle of the Alamo fell two days after we took our first inmate here for stealing a watch. Uh, we operated here continuously for 168 years. We closed our doors September the 15th of 2004, bust out 50, uh, 1,355 maximum security inmates to a new facility that we built for them about six miles east of town, and most of them still reside there to this day. Because this was maximum security from start to finish, it was documented the most violent penitentiary in the entire United States and the largest. Uh, we averaged somewhere between around 2,000 to 3,500 inmates, meant to house about 11 to 1,200, always grossly overpopulated. Our peak capacity was over 5,000 inmates at times, which is uh, triple what we were supposed to house. So you're housing the most heinous, violent repeat offenders you can imagine in your worst nightmares right here. Um, if I don't know any place that's haunted, it has to be this one. So let's go ahead and get started. We're going to move on upstairs to the first housing unit. Okay. What an ominous way to introduce the tour. The worst of the worst. So it is. All right, let's go on down here. Come on in. Wow. Well, this is housing unit number one, H Hall. It was built between 1901 and 1904, specifically to house females, starting in 1905, moving them out in 1926. It was actually the last housing unit for the women. We had several others because our first female came in in 1842. We were not prepared for women whatsoever, but there was no discrimination here. For almost the first hundred years, no officials had ever come in, no rules were being followed. It was being run by outside businessmen and guards inside the facility. So when women came in, we just figured out what to do with them. Built some housing units, more females came in, which required a larger housing unit. This is the last one we had them in. This is my favorite housing unit. Uh, we all have our favorites. I don't think it gets enough attention. Historically or paranormally, uh, it doesn't house death row, it's not the oldest housing unit, it's just a box with cells. But if you give it enough time, this one will turn itself on. I mean, it just will. Uh, we punished women as severely as we punished men. And if you look over here, there's a punishment cell. We called it a blind cell. Because if you did enough time in there, you would come out blind. They did their time completely in the dark. Isolation was um, the punishment. We not only used brutally violent physical torture, uh, but also mental torture as well. And we were very good at both. Uh, we doled it out on a daily basis for a multitude of things or absolutely nothing at all. Guards discretion, who got punished, what they were punished for, how much punishment they received and what type. It literally could be for just looking at a guard in the face and him deciding to take his bad mood out on you that day. Let's go on down here. I talked about that overpopulation. Uh, literally, it was within two years of us taking our first inmate up until the very last second. When the women were moved out of this building, it became what they called R&D, receiving a diagnostic. And for about, well, until they built the Fert, uh, Fulton facility, which is about 70 years later, this was male housing unit. Women were one man per cell. If you look at these cells, when this was R&D, they were sometimes holding up to six adult men in six. every one of these cells. Yes, yes. Uh, it, the grossly overpopulated term is not um, a, an exaggeration at all. So, you know, you were just stacking them and packing them in here. So, 
of course it was going to be the most in violent the prison. Like this, oh, can you imagine? I say that right now. You've got angst and anger, and they're sad and they're depressed, and you just stuff them in here, and it's 130 degrees. Uh, like two, three weeks ago, we really had an awful, awful spell of like 110, 115. Some of us stopped coming up here. I didn't. I kept bringing group, groups up because you know you're going to get what you pay for. I'm going to bring you up here and make you suffer. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, we want, I'm going to make you experience what it was like. And I cannot imagine how they even spent a single day or night in this facility. I, I just don't. I wouldn't be able to do it. I mean, you don't have much choice once you're here. What are you going to do? But I just can't even wrap my mind around it at all. Come right here, watch your head in this facility. It was not meant for tall people. Yeah. So to get upstairs, and there are three walks, uh, four total, in this housing unit. The stairs are here. So they go up every level. Uh, it kind of makes a circle. So you just are walking around. You look at the cells. You come back here. You come back down. So, you know, I thought, think of there I was a fire. And the poor soul that's, you know, male or female, all the way on the end, very top, they'd have to come all the way down here first to get down the stairs and then have to go all the way back down there to get to the stairs to go down. We didn't care, you know. Feds came in and said, you need more stairs. We're like, why? Well, what if there's a fire? We're like, and? Yeah. <laughs> well, the guys can't get out. What is your point exactly? You know, put some more stairs in. That's our point. And we really didn't like being told, you know, what to do by authorities and feds when they first started coming in. I'm pretty sure that we fought them tooth and nail. Every time they made a suggestion that we thought we needed, they needed us to follow and we didn't think the guys here deserved. Uh, in this housing unit, some things you might experience, just so you know, you might uh, have some ideas. Um, we do have a gray lady. Um, she was seen by inmates when the inmates were actually here. And then some of us have seen her, guests have seen her throughout the years. She hasn't been seen frequently, um, but she's usually caught on one of the upper walks. And we call her the gray lady because you just see uh, the tail end of her dress, you know, sweep around the corner or something of that nature. Um, she's been described as period uh, clothing with a bustle, which actually does not kind of go with the time period of when the women were in here, but maybe she was a... Uh, uh, the wife of a guard or, you know, the warden's wife or a matron or something along that lines, we don't know. But bustle, hair in the bun, white collared, stiff shirt, you know, the whole thing, and then the, the gray um, skirt, which would have, would have been what a matron wore in here. So maybe the bustle they saw was a shadow and that wasn't even a bustle at all. So, all right. <laughs> We're right, we went all the way around, as I said, each level does that same thing. You just, you got to think outside the box, you know, in here people are like, let's go into a cell. And cells aren't necessarily where you always want to look. Mm -hmm. Gotta agree. You know, I mean, they weren't in their cells at all during the day in here. They all worked, they all had jobs. Uh, if you were in your cell, that was, I don't know why you would have been, because if you didn't work, you got punished, so. It's kind of sad, too, yeah. if you're a ghost to just stay in your cell. You've got this whole property. Exactly. And I just get a lot of things happen. In this lobby, for example, strange things happen in this lobby. Come on out here a little bit. So we were just up here, which was housing unit number one, H Hall. And I know you can't see it, but way over there in the dark um, is a uh, housing unit that was built in the 1930s. We have never had access to it on tours. It's really nothing uh, aesthetically architectural about it. It's just like caged cells. And they fell apart pretty quickly when they moved the inmates out. They were state contracted. I'm sure the lowest bidder got the job, threw them up, and they quickly fell apart after they stopped using them. Uh, we'll be going in that building in a moment. Let's venture on down the path here. It's absolutely enormous. Um, 98, probably 95, 98 percent of it, unfortunately, is gone um, because a lot of it just was torn down when they first moved the inmates out. They did not ever expect, you know, us to be able to have folks like you coming in or <laughs> guests coming in to tour the place. And we started and we just exploded. So dining hall is gone you know a lot of the housing units are gone <laughs> things of that nature what happened 
What happened? Dining hall's gone. Dining hall is gone. <laughs> yes, no chow tonight, Connor. Connor doesn't get any chow. I'm definitely getting lost then. <laughs> so this hallway is an example, and it goes the same way. The other direction connects you from that lobby area. So like when we walked out, there's a, it goes both directions. Goes to housing unit number two, red brick, or on the other side over there to housing, I'm sorry, two and five, I'm turned around. And so it literally was like just an alleyway where the inmates, you know, moved throughout the day from one place to another. A lot of that in here. And I mean, this section right here were constant shankings because you could have multiple, multiple, hundred, couple hundred guys moving through that hallway at once. Uh, everybody's got a contraband weapon and you walk through and you just shank as you go. Guy falls down, you keep walking and they have a really hard time ever figuring out, you know, who got the guy. So, uh... Killings were almost daily, if not most certainly weekly, in here between inmates. And then, of course, the punishment of, from the guards with the inmates. Just so much violence, always. Inmate on inmate, guard on inmate, inmate on guard. You know, it was just a crapshoot. Oh, there went a little lightning. Yeah, I know. I, saw, I keep seeing it getting All right, so it. as the sign says right there, this is housing unit number four. Watch your step when you come in. Evening, boys. How are you? Oh, my God. It's me. Now, we can leave it like this, or we do have runner lights underneath. Oh, this is fine. Okay, that's what I'm saying. Can't hunt with the lights on. Come on in. This <laughs> is everybody's favorite housing unit. You can sit if you want, stand, do what you want. And you can see why uh, it was built in 1868. It is the oldest housing unit that we have on site left. So uh, the female department we just came out of was early 1900s, 0104. This one was 1868, so almost five decades earlier. And you can immediately see the difference. The cells are on the outside of the housing unit and the inside is completely open. And the reason for that was, you know, there was no such thing as rebar. And cement and concrete was something that had not been used and hadn't hadn't been invented yet and so these guys in here had to go back to greek and roman times and when you step into the cells they all have the arch ceiling which is the way greeks and romans had to do it to build the Colosseum and things like that to hold the weight of all of the levels that are above so this is also a four level housing unit there's this main flag walk and that's what they called the main level and then three walks above this housing unit just has some major history major it was really three different things throughout the years. Uh, for the first probably 70 to 80 years, there was absolutely no electricity in here. So it was candles for light, uh, no heat at all, buckets for waste. So again, uh, there were at times six men in every one of these cells and you multiply that by, there's about 145, 46 usable cells. Uh, you get 750 guys and they're using a bucket. Uh, what does it smell like in here this time of year? I can't even fathom who got the job of emptying the bucket every day because it would have been an inmate, you know, and I'm sure the con boss because there was one of those in every housing unit. That was a real thing. He was the one that decided, I'm sure, who got those types of um, duties. And you were probably either the scraggliest one in here or new guy probably got that, which either way, it was not good. It was the most violent in the early days, we had a whipping post in here that we used, which I'll show you that area here in just a couple of minutes. So the violence and bloodshed in this building was just off the charts in the early days. Then it switched gears and for about 70 to 80 years again, it was segregated, all black. And my favorite inmate uh, story came out during that time period. It was a gentleman who walked in here uh, didn't know how old he was because he didn't know, never knew his own birthday. There is a metal cutout over there. I don't know if we can shine our light over there to make him make, uh, let's see. There he is right there. Um, that gentleman's name is Sonny Liston. And Sonny came in as one of those very young, angry men that I was speaking of earlier. Uh, he had Mr. Sonny Liston, yes sir, and it's an awesome story. Uh, he came in as a very angry young man. He had had a crappy childhood, just a crappy childhood. Uh, there were 25 total children in his family, second relationships for his mother and a gentleman, and, you know, two families were merged together, 25 children in the Deep South. Uh, people were starving to death down there. 
His new father beat his mother. Um, he was an alcoholic. She finally just got fed up and said, I, I can't take it anymore, I'm leaving. So she leaves and heads up north, heading towards St. Louis, where apparently she had some relatives. She allowed the older children to decide whether they wanted to come with her or stay. It was probably the biggest mistake Sonny ever made in his short but sad life, um, or sad but short life, because he did decide to stay, and of course his stepfather didn't care anything about him. He was quickly running the streets, he robbed a, a grocery store, he got two charges with robbery with a deadly weapon, got five years, came in. He was a very large young man. Uh, he had a 15 inch fist circumference, which there is a paper cuff in cell number 33 that measures 15 inches and it is just huge, it's unimaginable. 84 inch reach span. They had just started a boxing program here, a friar named Alois Stevens from St. Louis uh, came in and started this boxing program. They threw up a makeshift ring down in the lower yard and had the guys come in. And he took notice of Sonny pretty quickly, came up to him, said, do you want to give it a try? Sonny said, yes, long story short, he was very good. They actually went to Missouri State Probation and Parole and requested a full pardon for Sonny. And they gave it to him, which was almost unheard of in here. It was on the premise that they would take him out promote him in professional boxing, be responsible for him, teach him how to read and write because he was illiterate. That did not happen. Um, he was illiterate until the day he died, but he learned to sign his name while he was in here. And he went on to be a Missouri State Golden Gloves champion and then heavyweight champion of the world. It was a very short-lived championship. He was beaten by a seven to one underdog who stepped in the ring and his name was Cassius Clay and most folks know him as Muhammad Ali. That was before he had went uh, Muslim and changed his name. He was literally an unknown individual. Sports historians, some of them actually think that that fight was rigged. Uh, there's a video of it out on YouTube and they say you can watch it and he just doesn't even hit Sonny. They say there's no way that that young man, Cassius Clay, would have ever knocked out Sonny because he was just a brutal fighter, brutal. Sonny had a gambling problem. He had kind of got wrapped up with the wrong people, owed some money, and they think maybe he, you know, took a dive in order to pay off that debt. Who knows? He died pretty young, too, in mysterious circumstances as well. So hard to say, hard mm -hmm. to say. And then it switched gears again, and this was the honor dorm. Uh, so you got some perks, but you had to be, you know, violation-free to get on a very long waiting list to be in here. All the guys wanted to be in here because of those perks, um, such as finishing your work for the day, uh, you could actually come back and read a book or take a nap. The cells by then had no locking mechanism. They had worn out from the constant opening and shutting of almost a, over a hundred years by then. So you had to go to the commissary and purchase a lock with your own money. <laughs> <laughs> and you definitely wanted to purchase a lock. I don't care if this is a trustee status dorm. These are, are, you know, you're talking convicted killers and things in here. They are going to steal your stuff if they have the opportunity. But they could have almost anything in here if they could afford to buy it uh, and able to get it in the commissary. So a lot of TVs were in here, radios. There were gentlemen in here that had shag carpeting on their floors. Um, there was a gentleman who had a very large, we've heard a 90 gallon fish aquarium with tropical fish. Uh, oh yes, and this is real, we have photos. Uh, in fact, that gentleman supposedly was one of the masterminds of our 1954 riot, which we can talk a little bit about when we get to that location. His name was Jackie Noble. Uh, so this housing unit again, just so many things over the hundred and some odd years that this building was used. And it actually was the last building that uh, they took the guys out of. Um, you know, it was not only sentimental to us, uh, guests, employees, but mostly to the inmates that were living here. And most of the guys that were in here were actually living. Uh, you know, they knew they were never going to see the light of day. This was home. And so it meant a whole lot to them. So let's go on downstairs here because we're not done. Let's venture down here, shall we? Let's go. I say yes. <laughs> I am like dying from how humid it is. Can you imagine this? No. I, I mean, really and this is not bad. I'm not kidding. Like three weeks ago, it, it, was, it was pretty bad. Wow. It was pretty bad. So this um, area is what the inmates called the hole originally. So there were no showers down here. Those stairs were not there. This concrete uh, cement block wall was not here. It was just a hole in the floor. 
and this was punishment for this housing unit. That's what the inmates called it was the hole because it was just a dark hole in the ground. If you look down in the pit, that's exactly what it looked like, the hole. So they would actually lower these guys down in baskets with ropes and pulleys and there would be a guard down here already waiting and you were going to receive punishment down here. And again, I cannot stress that it could have literally been for anything, just anything at all. We had a whipping post right here. This was a dirt floor and the whipping post was sitting right here. They would strap a man to the whipping post and they actually whipped in here with a cat of nine tails, which is a short handled whip with about eight to 10 to 12 short leather straps. And so at the end of those leather straps, we attached shards of metal and glass and it did fillet a man's flesh to the bone. I mean, it was a very efficient form of punishment. And guards were allowed to whip a man 99 times. I mean, they got to choose. So you say you, you know, stumbled out of line going to the dining hall one morning and you got jerked out just for that. The guard decides you're going down here. He could have had you get 99 lashes just for that reason alone. I don't think 99 happened very often because I'm pretty sure that you would have died, you know, from that. And we needed you here because we did have over 60 factories. Um, that we were running in here, boots and shoes and brooms and soap and binder twine and a license plate for the state of Missouri. And it was all done using prison um, inmate labor. And so we needed them, but we were gonna punish you. So there was a fine line, I'm pretty sure, but you could have gotten 40 lashes strictly for something like that. And you think, okay, I'm done. You know, I have made it through this punishment and you're hanging there on that post and they cut you down and you just slump to the floor and you're not done not in here because then you're going in here and this is a dungeon oh. and it's called a dungeon because that's exactly what it is so there are eight cells down here um, two going this way and it actually makes a U so all the way around the back side of this uh, cinder block wall and stops right there so it just goes around let's just step inside here for a second you got night vision or are you gonna oh you're fine you got you got light on there darn I got, I got light vision. i'm kind of blinded all right now all i'm seeing is a square of light but it's okay make sure i don't run into a wall would you I yeah. come on in here because are you able to turn that light off easily yeah because i want to have you do it all of you kill them all oh my, oh my god, god. Can, you, <laughs> can you imagine this no now <laughs> yeah there you are hello so you know you are thrown in here bleeding to death your flesh is hanging off the bone they toss you into one of these cells and there would have been a solid iron door and then on the outside of that was a solid wooden door it was all about keeping the light out down here literally they buried you alive and men spent days and weeks and months and years at a time in these cells being punished we know a couple of them by name so it is documented so you're thrown in here and they shut the door and it is pitch black i mean i'm a missouri girl it's cave dark we're the cave state so you hold your hand up in front of your face you're never going to see it doesn't matter how long you're looking so they went completely blind they went crazy both they killed each other they committed by just banging their heads against the walls over and over and over until they just fell to the ground and bled out um that's that it, happened oh yes really? oh all the time all the time dude uh starvation because it was one piece of bread slid through a bread slot on the bottom they'd whip that wooden door open slide that breadboard, jerk it back out, and slam that door shut. So it literally was a five second, um, barely any light that might have been resonating from you know outside, or if the uh, guard brought in a candle or whatever he might have had, none, zero. And uh, uh, disease was rampant. Uh, you're talking cholera and typhoid and syphilis. It was all through the facility, but down here, I can only imagine because they would stuff over a dozen men in every one of these cells down here at a time. So you've got diseased men in there that are shoulder to shoulder with others and it's just spreading like wildfire. Open wounds. Oh, oh, you got open wounds, that's for darn sure. And they didn't wrap them 
uh, unless you may have gotten lucky and grabbed a wool blanket somehow that you drug in here or that, you know, how, but you wrap that around you and that's it. Well, you're going to peel that off later and that's not going to be fun. But no toilets, no plumbing ever down here. So you got a dozen men in these cells, one bucket. You're swimming in it. I mean, it was unbelievable. It, it truly was unbelievable what they experienced down here. If they died, and a lot of them did down here, I'm pretty sure this is one of the highest death locations that was in this facility, is this area. And we had other dungeon areas in buildings that are gone now, you know, that were raised over the years and something else got built on top because that's just how we did it here. Uh, use it till it can't be used anymore and build something on top. Um, just hundreds, hundreds and thousands of guys that died down here, but they never removed the dead bodies. So you've got men that are just in these cells with two or three dead bodies along with them decomposing the entire time. Oh yeah. Uh, why, I, why wouldn't they remove the body? Well, why would they? <laughs> you don't you don't deserve that. Not wow. in here. And you know, we try to tell our tour guests, uh, at least I do, we can understand it because it was a different time, period. And that's really the only way you can even comprehend by just being able to say it was different then, uh, people thought different, uh, it was terrible, yes, but we don't think that way, thank goodness, but it does wrap all the way around here. You can take a look down this hallway. You will find random chairs everywhere in the facility because you just never know where somebody's going to sit for a while and have a session or whatever. So there are a couple cells down here also. Any of them down here that are open, again, you are allowed to come back in here and, and see what you find. Uh, this particular cell right here, you know, orbs, lately we've been seeing a lot more light anomaly than usual, a couple of us, and you all know as well as I do, orbs, people, oh, orbs, no, that's dust, you know, or that's a bug, sorry to you know, <laughs> burst your bubble there. And they're hard in here to catch, but I have a photo, and it was our cashier one night, I was doing a tour, and there was a break between tours, and sometimes they'll just walk the tour with us, and she decided to come. And she was in here with guests, and she came up to me after, and she said, Jenny, I want you to see this picture. And she had an iPhone, and it was live, which she didn't even know what that meant, because I'm like, uh, do you realize this is a live photo? Two of the absolute biggest, most perfect orbs I have ever seen floated in. You can see them come from the outside, from the wall, so they just materialize. And then one of them actually sits over a guest's head, and the other one kind of just swoops off camera. Just, just one of the coolest things I've ever seen. So down here, um, things can get different, okay? So you just need to kind of be on your guard a little bit in this area because it is such a violent location. You know, things tend to feel a little different down here. Most of what we get in here, in my opinion, is light light, random, that kind of thing. But there are a couple locations where it's a little more ominous and a little more heavy, and this, of course, is one of them. And that's strictly because of what happened here. You know, again, you have men that are dying in here on a regular basis as they were down here. Uh, you know that some of them have decided to stay. And you know, we don't know why. Did they love it that much? You know, why are they stuck here? We ask them. We don't really get told that answer much, but maybe they don't know why they're still here. But, all right. Wow, nice. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know where those cell doors came from, upstairs somewhere. <laughs> Imagine that. And a lot of things you do see and play did not actually come from like this. This was not down here. Yeah. It got brought down here. Uh, but everywhere you're going, and not just down here, but everywhere tonight, you really need to watch where you're walking, when you're walking, because there are just little edges and steps and things like that everywhere. But there's an inmate footlocker that got drugged down here. They all got issued a footlocker when they came in. So that's real. But, yeah. And in here on the wall on this side, there's remnants of a couple shackles where they were shackled to the wall and then. Here is a very good um, look of what the doors. I said, so you had this solid iron one, and then there's that little slot that the bread board would go, and then this frame would have been a solid wooden door. So, wow. yeah, pretty bad down here. 
The best, one of the best things you can do in this building is just sit in those metal chairs and watch. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. We see more movement um, up above on the walks in this building than any other. We have police officers that normally come in here with us at night. About five years ago, they started coming in for safety. You know, we're in here alone a lot. One of the female officers came in, and she had been in here several times working, but she'd never taken a photo. You know, who knows why, just never did. And she stood about right here, and she took a picture just right up there on that second walk, right about there. And she caught one of the best full-body shadow figures that any of us have ever seen caught wow. in here. And we, you know, guests in here catch pictures. I mean, it, it's fairly often, you know, that people do catch just photos on their cell phone even. So you just never know. You just never know. Um, this is an original cell door. Uh, so every cell in this uh, housing unit looks just like this. And again, I mean, it's solid iron. It's very heavy. This has no locking mechanism on, the, uh, <laughs> on it, by the way. That's why I can close it. But it won't close. So every door looks just like this. One of you go in there. Well, one of you go. Connor. Connor. Oh, no. Original window in there, too. Look, see, it's just a couple slits. They didn't open or shut, so no air circulation or anything. Not like what they are now. Okay. Now you can come out when you're, when you're ready. I'm not going to ruin, not gonna ruin that out. shot. Right, Dan, we don't have locks. Yeah. So you saw what he did going in and out? Yeah. So subservience yeah. was actually built into these housing units back in the early days. So one of the... Uh, four rules that we had on paper in the very early days was you never raise your head without tipping your hat and asking permission before you speak to a guard or they would beat you strictly for that. So these were cut short to keep you in a, subser a subservient position every time you stepped foot out of the cell. So you were to know your place in here immediately. So when the feds came in here for the first time in the 30s, um, you know, they said, oh no. <laughs> you got to cut these doors and so they cut them all you know and raised them all and now you can see the difference if you look side by side see wow they left this one for whatever reason we have no clue why maybe used it for storage or whatever but it's great because now we can actually see exactly what it was like in here again they literally were treated no better than animals you know we treat our pets better than that so with the kind of violent angriness of the basement mm -hmm. do people get like physically touched or scratched or anything you know i i have had and i don't know about anybody else i i've heard a couple i know of but i had a guest um last season two seasons ago woman uh stopped down at the gas chamber at the end of my tour as everybody was leaving and her and her uh, boyfriend husband whatever came up and said uh look at the back of her legs and she turned around and down both calves um, she had scratches, and I do have those photos. Uh, they, we, I took pictures right there while she was standing at the gas chamber. So that was literally, you know, we go from here to the gas chamber in 45 minutes. So, you know, it was when, you know. Wow. Yeah, you could definitely see them. People get touched in here, but like I said, um, it is usually not malicious. I mean, it just isn't. But touching, hearing voices, seeing shadow figures i've heard my name i've got my name on evps before so the best thing you can really do in this facility in our opinion is talk to them like humans uh, just you know do you have a family what's your wife's name you know do you like gravy on your mashed potatoes that's one of my favorite questions you can ask them all day what they did to get in here first off you may not want to know um, because these guys were i can't again can't stress enough they were the worst of the worst. They don't want to talk about that all the time. You know, they don't, they want to talk about themselves. I, you try to make it personal. You got to, again, you got to think outside the box because sometimes they'll just shut down, you know, if you start asking things like that, so. Um, this upper courtyard area was different things over the years. There was once a working water fountain out there, uh, greenhouses. So imagine you've got a mass murderer growing award-winning roses, but you know, gardening was therapeutic. So it was a way to help them relieve stress, keep them calm. Uh, there was a chapel at the end of the sidewalk and it was built in the 70s. It was very modern looking. And so when they started tours, they actually demoed that intentionally because aesthetically it just didn't really match the quad, you know, area up here. 
And I have been told by employees that worked here, and our day tours, history tours, are done by employees that used to work here. Uh, they said that was a building that a lot of guys did not want to work in because there were so many corners and angles, it was very easy for inmates to hide, so a lot of knifings and shankings actually happened in the chapel. I mean, think about that. <laughs> In the house you know, of God. Yes, you don't even have enough morals or standards to not. I mean, it was this place. It was just savage. I mean, it really, truly was. They every every day just to make it into bed at night and be locked down to get up and do it the next day was probably a pretty amazing feat. What was the nickname of this place? Uh, the bloodiest 47 acres in America. And Time Magazine actually called us that in 1967. This housing unit is just monstrous. You could spend a solid night or day, and we'll kick a couple of these open, day tours that come through. We'll close some of these off. So that there, we went in the office area. You'll see that out of bounds. That's a pretty common tag in here. It means inmates here out of that don't belong there, yeah. So that was office in there. Um, this actually cage area, all of this caging was not in this housing unit originally. It was put in after the 1954 riot for added security and I'll talk about that a little bit when we go downstairs. But this is housing unit number three and it was built in two different sections between 1914 and 1918. So first section, 14 to 16, they needed to expand, of course, because we needed more housing for inmates, had them coming in like crazy, and so they built another section on out the other end between 16 and 18. Uh, they called it 3A and 3B, and from this level all the way up end to end, again, four levels, that's our magic number in here, was general population. Now in the early days, General population in here could have literally been anything from a petty thief to a mass murderer because they did not separate by crime uh, in the early days. That, again, did not start until later on. So you could have had, you know, four guys in a cell and two of them been mass murderers, one of them kidnapped for fun, and the other one stole a coat because he was freezing to death in the winter. It, you know, it could have been anything. So I'll just walk you over here just so you can kind of see. This area up here, I, I call it the mezzanine area. I'm not crow's nest, whatever you want to call it. When it was painted this blue and white, you see old photos of this building. It was gorgeous. I mean, it was absolutely beautiful. It looked like an opera house in here. And you need to understand uh, the three housing units that you're going through tonight, along with the gas chamber when we get to that, they were hand-built by our inmates here. And when I say hand-built, they were issued pickaxes and shovels every morning. We had limestone rock quarries here on site and they hand quarried every stone, got them up here by whatever means they had available on their back in a wheelbarrow, whatever, and hand laid every one of these stones to build these massive housing units. Um, it is an incredible feat of workmanship when you look at these things. Considering you look at those red brick ones that I said were built in the 1930s by state contractors and they're falling apart. <laughs> right. True. I mean, it is, it is apples and oranges, really. I talked about Sunny Liston uh, over in housing unit number four. Well, let me show you who was in this one. And a lot of inmates, you know, in here over the years, especially again in the early days, we don't know what units they were in, what cells, because they got moved around sometimes. They kept very poor records in the early days. But we do know that right here was Mr. James Earl Ray. And I never knew the man was in here until I started working here at the facility as a tour guide. Uh, he came in, uh, he was a petty thief, pretty much a nobody, small fish in a big pond in here, but he was a um, wiry little guy. He liked to escape from places. So he tried unsuccessfully several times here. They actually found him in some pretty odd locations. After he'd be missing for a couple of days, they'd locate him hiding in an air duct or, you know, God knows where, these weird places, and lock him down, you know, put him in punishment for a while, and then he'd try it again. He worked in our prison bakery. This was a self-sufficient city. Everything an inmate needed was in here. Um, they never needed to take an inmate out. We had a hospital here. They never had to bring things in. Everything that was needed was manufactured, grown, 
produced whatever in the facility. So we had a bakery and he worked in it. History tells us that the bread truck rolled out of the prison one morning because it did deliver bread to what we call satellite prisons or prison farms, which are medium and minimum security um, in the area and would feed the inmates in those facilities. And he got into one of the bread bins, the boxes that would hold the, the baked goods and they put loaves of bread and things on top of him. And I, the guard, for whatever reason, just did not check the van and the bins well enough that Sunday morning, I think it was a Sunday, and just, he drove out. He got out, uh, skipped on down to Mexico, got him some reconstructive plastic surgery, came back, and almost a year to the day later, teletypes throughout the United States were going off from the FBI with his photo saying, anybody know this man? Well, we said, we do. He escaped from here almost a year ago. I said, could we have him back? And they said, absolutely not. He just assassinated Dr. Martin Luther King uh, Jr. So he was on our escapee list at that time with a $50 bounty on his head from escaping uh, this <laughs> facility. Yeah. But again, you know, bounties based on the crime you commit. And when he came in here, he was a nobody. So he didn't gain that notoriety until he went on to kill uh, Dr. King. And of course, they took him to Brushy uh, Mountain in Tennessee. Brushy Mountain. Yeah. yeah. Well, we he escaped out. once down there, caught him in about three or four days. So again, uh, just huge. This housing unit is huge. Look at the window uh, mechanisms. These would have had a hand crank that are now gone or broken. And they hand cranked these open every day and then cranked them shut every night or as they you know, needed the ventilation. And again, the story t uh, goes that when these broke, uh, the cranks, you know, we didn't replace them here. Sorry, you broke it. We're not gonna <laughs> fix it. Somebody got the job, inmate-wise, of shimmying up this pole every night, and they hand-opened every one of the windows as they went down, and then at night, they went back up and closed them all. So can you imagine having that job in here every day? No. You know you were the smallest little guy that got that job. <laughs> oh, <laughs> if you had to make a choice, definitely. So what Absolutely. about, like, Prisoner, prisoner murders. Thousands. Really? It, we have no idea. I, and it is in the thousands. Again, in the early days, there were no records kept at all. Uh, then, as they did start keeping them, they were poor at best. Um, they called them a warden's report. And some of them were actually just pencil, you know, figures of this many men came in this month, this many men went to the uh, infirmary, the hospital, whatever. So we really just don't even know. Thousands committed suicide. Thousands were uh, killed in their own inmate-on-inmate -inmate violence. Some were killed punishment by guards, I'm fairly certain, of course, uh, but we don't know. But the death in this place was astronomical. I mean, that's just the best word for it. Everywhere, uh, you know, they, that's why they called us the bloodiest 47 acres in America because they did a, a report, a survey, and I believe it was like from 1964 to 65 of all the prisons in America, and we had the most violence um, by death or uh, fighting or whatever it was uh, that there was hardly an inch in here that didn't see bloodshed on it. So, yeah, pretty insane. Yeah. Need to make a call? Yeah. Same thing over on this side again, it's just a mirror image of each other. So what's over here is the same over there as far as stairs and everything that, that take you up. Let's go, let's go downstairs. Let's do, and again, in this housing unit, I can turn the lights off, I can leave them on. We can do for a while of both, whatever you want. Okay, so upstairs was 3A and 3B, general population. Uh, this level, that side, that side, again, mirror image of each other. Uh, they called it 3C. You know, they just continued on with the alphabet. It, it worked. Um, 3C means death row. So this level um, is death row, both sides. Let's go this way. Uh, this is one of my favorite little locations. This is where they actually rinsed off death row inmate meal trays. You can see the slots, the drying racks, because death row inmates, you know, ate in their cells. They never came out. They were never commingled with other inmates. Rec time was segregated, and they didn't really get rec time. They didn't uh, play sports, you know, or any of that kind of thing like the other guys did. They literally just, when the feds said we had to give them an hour out, because before that they were locked down 24-7, 365. We never let them out. 
Um, when they said we had to give them an hour out, out here in the back, they just cut a couple doors open and they built dog cages. Uh, that is literally what they are, they're dog kennels. Um, and they were allowed to go out and stand for an hour on a concrete pad. Yeah. Let's go this way. Stand on a concrete pad for yeah. an hour, I'll pass. And I'll tell you what's interesting about those back there is there are a couple of them that half of them are concrete and half of them are grass. And the first time I ever saw them, I was like, okay, what's the deal? You know, did y'all just not finish the concrete <laughs> or what? Did you run out? What happened? And Larry Neal, who's the one of the, he was a head maintenance man here, he does the day tours, he came up to me and he told me, he said, I poured those, Jenny. And I said, okay, Larry, wh why? He said, the inmates asked for that on death row. They wanted to be able to step on the grass with their bare feet. I mean, we really can't understand that it's that simple of not being able to feel the grass on your bare feet. Yeah, so death row. So every cell on this level is a death row inmate cell. There are about 50 on this side, 50 on the other side. Death row um, was usually um, full capacity at all times, one man per cell, never doubled them up. You know, one of them would have been killed within about 10 seconds of putting them in the same cell because uh, this is a dismal existence down here. You have absolutely nothing to lose. Um, pretty much anything goes down here and there's not much you can do to them that they are not already, you know, there and have come back and are getting ready to go again for the final time. One thing uh, we notice and, and the guests notice usually um, when you look in these cells or how high the ceilings are compared to others that we've been through, you know why? No. So they couldn't commit Really? Uh, mm -hmm. Well, that's an easy way out. We're not going to give you that luxury. Wow. You know, we're going to do it the proper way in the gas chamber. So, Again, where we don't get it, but yes. Who were some famous death row inmates? Could you give, give like a couple yes, stories? Yes, um, there, there are a few, and we, we'll, we'll stop right here seeing how we're in that location. How about that? Perfect. What a coinky dink. <laughs> right here, cell number 23 was Walter Lee Donnell. And Walter Lee was a snitch. And you know, um, in this prison, as in any prison, snitches get stitches and end up in ditches. Uh, they put a hit out on him from inside. He had snitched on a pretty large St. Louis robbery group and they found out about it. They had some guys in here, put a hit out, you know, somebody take him out, we'll, we'll get you some money on your prison account. And so, like I mentioned over there, we, we hear that Mr. Jackie Noble uh, was one of the ones who kind of mastermind the whole thing as far as putting it together in order to get to Walter. Um, they literally set this place completely on fire. Every, almost all the factories, the, the dining hall, the admin buildings, the education building, the chapel, uh, everywhere except their housing units. They were smart enough not to set their houses on fire. You gotta give them a little credit, I guess. But they torched everything. They brought in the National Guard, every um, police officer and state trooper in the state of Missouri was called in here. It was huge. People that lived outside of the walls uh, literally were on their roofs with shotguns waiting to see if anybody escaped. And you know, if they saw something pop over the top of the wall, they were just shooting. They had no idea whether or not they were inmates, uh, whether they were guards or employees or whatever, but they were not going to take any chances on any of the inmates getting out of this facility into the city. Um, so they have really no idea where he is down here. They just know um, that he's being held in this building and he's on death row. And the reason they put him down here was strictly for his own protection because this was the most secure area in the facility was death row. So they locked him in this cell. And when they started that riot, there were a handful of them that were in on this whole thing, uh, kind of broke off as everybody else is, you know, running helter skelter, setting everything on fire and tearing everything up and throwing bunks and uh, et cetera. And they make their way over to this building and they came in um, right through the front door where we came in and they came right down the stairs that we just came in. And when they got down to the bottom of those stairs, um, I don't know if you all noticed, there was a little cage area where I call him the gatekeeper because I just think that sounds cool. But the guard that would have ran the um, block down here as far as lockdown and things of that nature. So in that area, you'll see a lighted um, board because it's a key and a board system. 
And so he sees uh, these individuals coming and he's like, okay, this isn't normal. He got about six you know, inmates coming down the stairs by themselves and he starts locking down death row. He locks all the gates, all the connecting doors everywhere. He pulls the key out of the um, board and he tosses it through the bars down there where we just came in. So they are unable to access death row, which was pretty smart for him to have done that in you know, that quick. So they kind of just look at him and one of them goes, hey, that's okay, we'll be back in a minute. And a couple left, they came back and they have a sledgehammer. And they walk right past him, there is a office area, and which is literally the wall right at the end of the hall where we are right now. And they take the sledgehammer and they just bust through the subway tile wall. And they make a hole big enough for them to crawl through and they all crawl through it and pick those keys up. Uh, that the guard has thrown in down there and now they have access to the entire death row cells included and again they don't know exactly where Walter's at they just know he's down here so they just start down there on the end methodically and one by one they are stepping up to the cells you know asking the guy to come up to the cell so they can see his face and nope you're not the guy we're looking for uh, they let out a few I guess we we've, we've been told that a lot of them did not come out of their cells even when they were offered don't know why maybe they thought better of it who knows and they just make their way down and so you think about Walter's down here somewhere they're calling his name out you know we're coming to get you and that kind of thing and they come on down and they stop right here and there's a gentleman that's just hovering over in the corner there you know back to the cell door and they're trying to get him to come up to the cell and he won't budge and they realize it's him and so they take the keys and they slide that cell door open and they step in there with that sledgehammer and they bludgeon him to death inside that cell. Um, I've heard other things, slit him uh, his throat from ear to ear, uh, you know, just whatever it was, it wasn't good. But the sledgehammer, we know that that did happen. So you've got six grown men um, that just bludgeoned him to death right, right in there. All because of a hit for probably a pretty paltry amount of money um, to get to him. But this set of bars right here was actually installed after that riot because these were not here and it was to make it even more difficult to gain access to these um, cells was because of what happened to poor Walter. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So you just kind of meander your way on through and you'll find your way out. Now these four cells right here, these are a side watch, punishment for death row, uh, depending on what they were being used for. There are four of these, so these are actually double sally ported doors, and what that means is guard would have unlocked this one, stepped inside, locked that one, and then he would have unlocked this one. So you always had a locked door um, between you, you know, outside and the inmate. Um, concrete block, that's what they slept on. So no wow. bunk, no mats, no blankets. They actually put them in a white paper suit because they gave you absolutely nothing that you could commit with. So you know, you could wrap the clothing around your neck and hang yourself. So a paper suit, you can't do that because it's just gonna rip apart. And you slept on that concrete block. Yeah. So February, how's that feel? So what was like the the most common way that people would take their own lives. In here, um, there were a number of ways. I'm sure they could have made a weapon, of course. Uh, one way I heard, and I, I do know this is true because several of the historians have, have mentioned this, but uh, let's go around here and I can kind of show you as an example. Okay. Here's the other ones of these. And then it just makes that same U-shape pattern. You know why a U-shape pattern is used, right? There's no corners. Oh, there you go. So this would have been a number of different things. Um, they actually would make prison hooch in their toilet bowls. I can't imagine what it tasted like, but hey, you know, uh, anything to get a buzz. And if you're drunker than Cooter Brown, they're going to lock you in here and let you dry out, you know. Um, or if they're doing a shakedown, you know, of your cell, you were shackled and then locked down in here. You know, death row inmate was never just standing off site, so, you know, off to the side somewhere while they did something. Just so you know, you probably see, all right, you, these are yeah. several locations throughout the prison. Um, one of our guides, one of my best friends, Diane Kitchell, uh, she took it old school this year. You know, we get bored, they get bored in here with the fancy electronic stuff. And so she hung these bells in several locations 
And if you hear the bells and you know none of you are in the vicinity, you know there's something going on. Yeah. I'm happy you guys heard this. Very first time that I came in here um, this year after she had hung them. I had actually completely forgot about that, that she had done it, completely forgot about it. And I had brought in a tour, and when we bring our tours down here, we come around, we line them up, you know, over there, and talk to them, tell them some stories, and then we walk them on around. And I had stopped my guests, and there were some young kids up in the front, and all of a sudden, this girl goes, do you hear bells? And I'm like, bells? And I went, bells! And I mean, come on! And I mean, I took, we all went running around, and there they were, and I, I just got goosebumps right there. <laughs> Nobody. Oh, we were the only ones in here. I mean, the only, and they were all behind me. So there was absolutely nobody and they that were could swinging? have done it. Yes, and they had been ringing. There was no question. So it was pretty cool. Because it just like took me a minute, and I was like, oh, the bells that Diane hung up. Holy heck! So still Jethro. Um, again, a um, couple other uh, names you wanted. Um, the. Last individual that we executed here, he was actually housed over on the other side of death row, was George Mercer out of Kansas City, Missouri. And he committed a, well, it wasn't him exactly. I mean, he was part of it, but he was the president of a couple of large biker gangs out of Kansas City, he had a birthday. And his guys pretty much asked him what he wanted. And he said, well, he said, you know, he said, there's that new waitress down at the bar that we go to in Belton, which is a suburb of Kansas City. He said, I want her. And so they kidnapped her coming out of the bar one night. She was 22 years old and they took her back to the house that they all kind of hung out in. and uh, They brutalized that poor woman for almost a solid week. Of course, she did not live um, to come out of the home. But to this day, anybody that's associated with him will say he really you know, didn't do it, kind of like that whole Charles Manson thing, he's not the one that did it, but he certainly participated. He was an evil individual. I mean, he most certainly was evil, uh, no question about that. So they call this the inmate walk and they call this the guard walk um, after they put this middle row of bars. And when I first came in here on this level and I walked down, I didn't notice it over there, but I did over here. I looked down and I immediately noticed the difference in the tile. I mean, this side is completely worn off. So the guards walked <laughs> okay. a whole lot more than those inmates did, didn't they? I mean, that side's oh, almost completely intact, but this is gone. <laughs> Again, oh, it, it is perspective and the way you, it's like, wow, okay. So just the constant walking back and forth completely wore this tile off the floor. The guards said this was a hard level um, to work, you know, again, they, these guys didn't have anything to lose, so they pretty much did unimaginable things. Uh, they showered like once every two weeks in the beginning. Uh, I'm sure that changed, I'm not sure how much often as it went on, but I'm sure that changed. Uh, again, one man per cell. Now you do see multiple bunks now. And the reason for that is after we executed George Mercer, and they called him Tiny, by the way, his nickname was Tiny Mercer, um, they built a new facility in Potosi, Missouri. That is over in the St. Louis area, strictly for death row inmates. And I think like the 200, 250 of the most heinous individuals you can ever imagine. And they moved death row out of this facility, took it out of Jefferson City completely, moved them down to Potosi, and then this level became general population, um, just as it was upstairs. And so, of course, we just started, you know, stuffing two or three guys. I, it was probably two to four, maybe, in this building for the most part over the years, because this building, again, by the time this building was built and 1918 ended, the feds started coming in, you know, not too long after that. So, of course, they changed the standards as to how many men you were allowed to keep in an 8x8 or a 10x10, 12x12. And that is truly the real main reason that they closed this facility down. It was more financially feasible to build a new one and just move them there than it was to get this one up to standards. And in order to get it up to standards, we would have had to probably build more housing units you know, because we were stuffing way too many in a cell and that was just going to end up costing more money. So uh, that was pretty much the only reason for um, decommissioning the whole thing. So, so do you guys ever have any serial killers here? You know, um, we did. Uh, one in particular, and he was from the Kansas City area. And his name was Robert Burdella. Uh, they called him Bob Burdella and he was known as the Kansas City Butcher. 
or the bone collector. And Bob came in on a plea bargain, a plea deal. He copped um, and he came in in the 80s. He had a fetish for um, young men and he kidnapped and brutally tortured six and he was all about torture. So he is, we like to refer to him as the Jeffrey Dahmer of Missouri, but he didn't cannibalize. He didn't take it to that step. But he did brutally torture. He kept detailed spiral notebooks of every detail of everything he ever did to these boys. Thousands of Polaroid pictures were found in his house and um, they caught him pretty quickly. Uh, his seventh victim actually ended up escaping his house, flagging down a UPS driver or water meter, water meter guy, I think is what it was. And of course they called the police and, and swooped him on, in on him immediately. He came in um, on a life without parole and story goes that he had a heart condition when he came in and that was real, he did. And we did have the hospital here and we administered his heart medication, you know, every day like he was supposed to be receiving it. And then apparently he started writing lawmakers at some point saying, I'm not getting my heart medication, you know, at the penitentiary anymore. And it was not shortly after that that he was dead. So he died here? I wouldn't be surprised if we didn't stop giving it to him. <laughs> But he died here. Yes, he did. Oh, I've definitely read yes, he did. all about him. Yes, he did. Have you? I've read several books. Yeah, yeah that he man. Is, I mean, you say brutal. That is an oh, understatement of how. You know, he had a torture was. board. He yep. gutted those poor is that the bone collector. Like the bone collector. He he actually took that name based on that. Oh. He actually came up with that nickname himself. I do believe based on that individual. Okay. Yes. But the Kansas City Butcher was definitely. And he had the, the house of horrors. Too. Oh yes, um, he the house was awful. They ended up um, demolishing it. Uh, the city, the yes, they they raised it. They didn't want the you know the people of the city wanted nothing to do with that house being there anymore. He also owned that little um, flea. There was a flea market down in Westport, uh, Missouri, which is again a suburb of Kansas City, and it was called Bob's Bazaar Bazaar. <laughs> so fitting. <laughs> We're going down here. Now these stairs you need to be very careful on. They're very short and they kind of got a pitch to them. So just be careful when you're walking down. We're not down in this one yet. Wow. This uh, is definitely I mean, just so much crazy history here. It is. It is history rich. I mean, there is, there is no doubt about it. Uh, I am constantly Googling, we all do, constantly researching, listening for more information and stories, and you always come up with something new. I've even had Pat, well we all have, we've had inmates on our tours before, <laughs> and wow. sometimes they're really chatty and they'll want to talk to you a little bit, and other times they're real quiet, you know, they just kind of walk around and look, or they'll bring their families in and you'll catch them going, you know, yeah, I was in this one over here, <laughs> so you can't, you're like, it's kind of cool. It really is. I've had some that have told me some really cool stories before. Um, so upstairs, 3A, 3B. Death row was 3C. This is 3D. Kill your lights for a second in this spot. Just take a look. Holy shit. Same thing applies down here. Whoa. Okay. So in the early days, this was called administrative segregation or ADSEG. And mentally and criminally insane in the very, very early days were in here and of course they were removed at some point. They shouldn't have been in here at all. Um, then it became punishment for the guys upstairs. We know that James Earl Ray um, spent some time down here. We don't know which cell, but he did, um, being punished for one of those several escape attempts um, that he was unsuccessful. But I want to show you, uh, when you look in these cells, let me find one. Okay, so when you look in these, you know, you think for punishment, you can step in, you think, wow, punishment, this is pretty big. Well, okay, you got a front door here, you got a patio here, you can receive guests, you know, not bad. No, this was actually a wall. So you had one cell here and one cell here. I mean, you could touch with your fingers. That's how big these cells were. Wow. And again, Warden came in here, I think it was in the... Um, 1940s he came down, New Warden, and he saw these and he said, no, you know, not on my watch. We're not going to treat, you know, men like this. So these cells are one of my favorite location and here's why. And I'll show you why. Because we're going to be going this direction anyway. Yes. 
Oh, yes. Come in here. Oh, and you have to come in here. So look at the walls. Oh, wow. This is all inmate. Oh, Every bit of it. Look at the clock. Life is short. Get to know God. <laughs> so some guy sat right up there on that ledge in the pitch dark with whatever he managed to smuggle down here and scratch this into the wall. Their names are up here. Mohawk Mike. Something life. Crip life. <laughs> and we, oh, and we did. We had Bloods, Crips, uh, Black Panthers right there. Crip life. Um, they were all in here in the 70s. It was one of the most violent time periods, decades that we had in here. And, and Brad was here. Brad, that's my favorite one, because that's like the female Karen, Brad. Brad. <laughs> or Shaky the not Shaky, I love him. Shaky, well, you get a, you get a lot of shakes. There's one right there. They're everywhere. Pot leaves, gang insignia. See, here's another one I like. Rest in peace. He's lit, he listing all his gang guys up there. And over here, we even have, um, yeah, because we also had the Aryan Nation in here. Mm -hmm. Sure did. Oh, it was awful in here in the 70s. It was awful. What, what do you mean by that? Violence. It was a, a brutally violent time period, inmate-wise, because, again, every gang that you could imagine was in here. And that was the time period that they came in and desegregated the prison, it was 10 years after the Civil Rights Act that they desegregated. And that was not um, because uh, the officials didn't do it. It was because the inmates wanted no part of desegregation. You know, again, people do not understand. On the outside, it's different. When you're in here, you need to be with whoever is going to have your back at all times. So, thunder, I really hope that was thunder because yeah, we all heard that. It's not like a metal to me. But yeah. yeah, and that's the bad thing about rain in here, so you'll have to kind of differentiate, but I don't think that was thunder. That was above us. That was. That, was that didn't like seem like it. I was just kind of hoping it was Didn't thunder. see how it was outside. That seemed to be, and they will move bunks. They'll oh drag bunks. Hello? Do that again! heard that screech. It happened. What night was I here? Sat I just got goosebumps on my legs. <laughs> Saturday night. On the hunt Friday night, I was not here, but they heard it. I did not know this. I came in and did a tour Saturday night. Had my guest stopped up there, and I had 36, 38 people. Every one of us heard the screech. I mentioned it the next day, and then the people from the hunt Friday night went, Okay, wait a minute. We just heard that the night before, and we have never heard this sound in here before, ever. And see, I'm talking and it's not doing it. Can we sit quietly for one more second? Boys! Who's up there moving furniture? You want to 
from down here. You know you can. Can you make that loud boom again? Screech is coming from death row. Where the heck is that? Okay. Like a door slamming. Like That's exactly what it sounded like. It was a metal door slamming. It shook the building. <coughs> I was thinking, it's, it's almost like someone like slamming their head hand to the bed. Yeah. No, that sounded like a door. Yeah. And the weird thing is, I'm trying to think. There really aren't any kind of doors That's what I was thinking. like that. Where are you? I just heard one. Yeah. Are you upstairs? You don't have to be afraid of us. Just want to talk to you. If we go around the other side, will you come down? And then we won't see you if that's what it is that you don't want us to see you. Thank you. You are awesome, you know that? Oh, we know that. Now they know that. <laughs> Stand by this doorway and see if, let's just see if we can get it one more time, because that's insane. Is it okay that we're here? You make that noise again, we might be able to tell where you are. Oh my God. You have got to be kidding me. What that's is like, that? That's, that's a door. That was on command. Okay. Steve! Oh my God. Uh, okay. Wait a second. How long have you been in here? 30 seconds. Oh, oh no. What? No. This is Dapper. This is Sergeant Dapper checking on me. He knows I'm in here alone. <laughs> Dude, we have been hearing, but we were hearing it the was weirdest a bang. metallic slamming. And like then repeatedly. this screeching sound. There was also a metallic sound like a across the floor for a little bit. <laughs> I didn't come, I, was, I didn't, uh, I just walked down the stairs when I heard your voice down here. You weren't just standing here slamming the door back and forth. <laughs> I didn't Steve would not do that. <laughs> I mean, it sounded like yeah, someone was like slamming stuff. Was angry. But I have your number. Okay. Wow. Oh my. Wow. God. That yeah, was well, I started walking up the stairs and I started hearing a man's voice. What? I'm like, oh yeah. God. <laughs> I just heard uh, when I walked in, I heard a bang down there. Go, okay, see, oh, that's oh, so weird. You heard the bed. You heard the bed. I, it sounded like down low, though. It wasn't oh. like Okay, and see, for us, it sounded, yeah. and this is what they do. It sounded like it was, like, on, it was on top of Yes, it. we thought it was up. I heard you say, are you upstairs? I did hear that. Okay, I, how <laughs> wild <laughs> is that? Okay, there you go. You wow. can't deny this one. <laughs> oh, my God. We're good now. Okay. Okay. Uh, plasmires so at the time, I just could not believe that we were hearing those noises echoing throughout the prison. I mean, what the hell is that? I mean, it was silent the whole time, 
And then we start hearing it's like a banging on metal. Connor thought it was banging on metal. I felt like it sounded like a door slamming. I couldn't really tell. But it was so loud that it was shaking the building and coupled with the fact that we were hearing footsteps and metal squeaking, it seemed like something was there trying to make contact with us. Now, I don't know if it wanted the guide's attention that we were with, it wanted our attention, or maybe it was the fact that there was a thunderstorm above with all the lightning. Um, it was ramping up the activity in there. I just, I couldn't picture a spookier scene being in an abandoned prison, one of the worst prisons in American history, underneath death row in no man's land with lightning flashing through the windows, thunder rumbling above and hearing a spirit violently slamming metal objects together upstairs. I mean, and it kept going. There were so many noises. I mean, just watch. I mean, that's the crazy thing though. I mean, he heard the Come on, we're gonna do something else. We're going around here. Yeah, see, that's it. And it's weird that he heard it. Yeah. When he heard me ask about it yeah. upstairs. Yes. Oh, wow. Well, that, that was weird. Well, I mean, you think about it. He would have to be sitting there slamming a door like six times we yeah. just heard it. Well, from this far away. He was already inside when we heard the last one. He heard it? Yes. So. Okay, so <laughs> here's another one of those examples of when they've left an original cell and we've just managed to be lucky because of that. So not only did it have the bar, but it also had the covering. And then this is what they called the bean slot. That was prison slang. You know, you're gonna put it in the bean slot. We're gonna leave that right there. You can see, I mean, again, there were no toilets ever down here. So these, these were guys. just bucket yep. cells. And they didn't get a bunk or a mat. I mean, I mean, that's a toddler's closet is what that is. And so- They're already good. There it is again. Did I do it again? Yeah. I want to see how, the reason we're going around, I want to show you anyways, we're going to see if we hear it from around this side. If we can differentiate where it's at. So they started with this walk, as far as for punishment, and then of course, as they needed to punish more inmates, because that's what we did, they expanded it and tunneled it all around back here. Did you hear a moan? Yes, yes. Oh, 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 no, listen, no. There's the bank. Well, I'm just going to tell you. And this is the area none of us like. Really? Oh, yeah. Really? Uh, I'll, no. 95% of us won't come down here by ourselves. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is the buddy system down here. Uh, walking out of here alone, we've all felt something, you know, running up on our backs. Uh, yeah. Did you hear the knock? Yes. God. So why don't you like this area? This is different down here. You can already see why. But yeah, um, it is, it is a, it's a way different feel. Why do you think that would be? Just we, we really don't know. Um, yes. That's a cricket. cricket. I think it's a cricket. That's a cricket. Oh. It's a cricket. <laughs> that's what I've been hearing. I thought a while ago when you said it, I was like, okay, that's I think that might have been the cricket. Welcome to Missouri. Yeah, right there. Um, when the tornado happened and we lost building four over there and you know we weren't able to take tour groups in, we started bringing two hour tours down here, which we normally did not. This is for our ghost hunts and our overnight investigations. Oh, I'm sorry. No, those was wasn't right over here. A pop, like a... a yeah, that I, was I, weird. I like a, did you hear that too? Yeah, like right here. Yeah, right here. We don't know, I don't know, you know, you think about it and we try to figure things out in here and you can't because you'll go crazy trying to figure things out in here, let's, let's face that. But I don't know if it was because we started bringing more guests down here more often, if it kind of peaked the activity or if maybe the tornado left something that didn't originate here. I mean, we don't know, but it's been different ever since then. Uh, sometimes just on a massive scale. 
as you're kind of experiencing right now. So we're going to go in here. The thunder doesn't help make it any less <laughs> ominous. Jesus. I have seen full shadows walk out of these cells before. So I'm going to have <laughs> You better stop. <laughs> Especially when I'm by a window. Sorry. I'm too old for that. Yeah, I'm 62. I'm 60. Fun. I hear you, man. Don't be doing that to old people. Jeez. So, let's just the lights off a minute. Kill your lights. See it over here. Feel it over here. Because you need to turn around. <laughs> you should be. I, we have all removed people down here who are nauseous, headaches, full-blown crying because they're just, you know, overwhelmed with this sadness feeling that they can't understand. Um, they mess with you down here a little bit more. Uh, like, you're on this side, you'll, yep, you'll hear tapping and things over there, so you go over there to that side to investigate and it starts doing it over here, so it kind of keeps you going with that cat and mouse thing. So, through this door, um, it's just kind of like no man's land back here. Uh, what do you mean by that? Well, you know, we get mediums in here a lot, and of course we've had a lot of other paranormal groups, and they just feel different things in this area. They tend to tell us to just, you know, be careful when you're down in this area. Oh my God. Um, I can, yeah, I can tell you two big stories of my own from in this area. Um, I have never screamed in this facility in eight years that I've been here, except for last season when I was in here. And it was myself and an assistant and about three or four guests and we all just gathered down there, and it is a dead end, excuse the pun, so if you go down there, you gotta turn around and come back. And I was standing with my back up against the wall, and they, you know, were around me. My James, the guide assistant, was over here, and we were just, you know, running a spirit box or whatever. And all of a sudden, I just felt the biggest poke in my back that I've ever felt, and I screamed, I, I was like, who, you know, is somebody do that? And I turned around and no, I mean, there was absolutely no way that anybody could have been behind me, but I felt my shirt move. I mean, it was my lower left, like right above my hip back here. And it was just jab. I was out. I mean, it was like, nope, I'm done. I'm out of here. And then it was several years ago. Don't remember exactly when. Had a couple of people on a hunt, which we get a lot of those non-believers and disbeliever type, and we tend to change their minds in here. And I was down here, and there's a shower at the end of the walk right down there. And the shower is just, I don't know, it's just creepy on steroids, it just really is. And so I ventured in there one night, silly me, I don't know what I was thinking, and two of these guys that were non-believers were down in there and I was again running a spirit box and I was sitting, every shower area have these little concrete benches where they could have put their towel or you know whatever. And I'm sitting on the bench, it's up against the wall and spirit box, you know, you were getting a couple cool things off. And all of a sudden it says mirror and it says it like three times and I'm like mirror. And I mean, I was up and I was out of that cell in a nanosecond. And these guys are like, what? And I said, step in there and look above my head where I was sitting on the bench. Yeah, there was a mirror right <laughs> above my head. And I'm like, mm -mm -mm, I ain't looking at no mirror in here. Yeah, the damn mess. So the psychics just said, you should go back. They, yeah. I mean, what was that? that was a okay, now wait a second. I heard more about What'd you hear? I heard like a breath type of a. That's what I heard, yeah. I thought it could well, I know when we stepped through the door over there, we heard the moan. Who's in here? I'm coming in. Are you in here with us?
whoever is making that noise upstairs, will you do it again? I'm trying to figure out where it's coming from. <laughs> Windows open. There we go. Oh, that's good. That was a good one. You behind us? Yeah. 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 That's what I think. I think they want to follow us around. If you're in here and want to communicate with us, will you make a noise? Got some good energy in here to use. I mean, I can't confirm it, of course, but I talked about having inmates on our tours every now and then. Two weekends in a row, about a month ago, I had inmates uh, on a Friday or a Saturday night, just a two hour tour. And one of the gentlemen um, came up to me over in housing unit four in the old housing unit. And he said he was in that housing unit, uh, late 80s, early 90s. And he said a couple things that confirmed that he knew exactly what he was talking about. He said there was a gentleman um, that was on the third tier, way in the back. He was within about three to four days of his release. And you know that institutionalization is a real thing for guys who have done a lot of time. And he was so scared about leaving and being on the outside that he hung himself right there in the housing unit off the third tier, yeah. So he just wanted to stay here in prison? Well, he didn't want to be out. Yeah. You know, they can't survive. They don't know how. Wow. Right? They just don't. So again, we can't quite understand that, but, you know, you're used to being told what to do, when to do it, how to do it. Uh, you get thrown out, and after you don't know anything, and, you know, decades have gone by and things change in the world. Nowadays, they're taught, you know, like computers, and they know how to use a cell phone. But back in the day, when you were locked up, you know, and things happened like automobiles and airplanes, and you come out after, you know, 30, 40 years, and it's like, yeah, you, you just don't even know how to survive. So it's pretty sad. It's exactly... Yeah. And that's exactly the analogy I use when I tell the story. It's the same thing. Yeah, it's true. It's and true. then, how many people did they estimate died here? We, have, we don't know. Is there like a ballpark? Thousands. Of I mean, literally, I have never heard a number. All I have ever heard is thousands. And if you figure 168 years of 3,000 to 5,000 guys in here at any given time, um, it had to have, it probably was in the tens of thousands, would be my guess. But no, we have no clue. No clue at all. And at the end of the day, you'd say this place is home. Absolutely. Yeah. No question, do you? Uh, yeah, I can already <laughs> say that. Oh my gosh. Well, you all are going to have a great time now because you're really going to start investigating. So we're going to go upstairs and on the way, maybe we'll hear that uh, sound again and we'll maybe try to pinpoint where that's coming from. Otherwise, you all need to come on back in here and see if you can. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll definitely be back. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I will be up in like the lobby area. I will also come out in the periodically to see what it wants to do. I'll try I try to jingle keys or something as I'm walking up. No, I think so that was coming. Definitely I'm death big, row area. I think it was too. Exactly where I think it was coming from. Okay. Hey guys!
Tell us where you are. Make a noise, we'll come up there. Can you make that bang one more time for us? We're just here to communicate with you. We're friendly. I mean, earlier when we were coached, getting ready to go up the stairs, it did it on cue yes. right yes. when yes. I asked. Right when we were going up. And so, see, it can't be wind because it's still windy. Yeah. It's still raining, and it's not doing it anymore. Well, now the thunder's here. It wasn't even thundering. Before. No. Yeah. Okay. Well, okay. I can't our stuff. Yes. Yeah. I am truly excited to do this. That was great. <laughs> that was crazy. I was going down here one night with a group, husband, wife, and I think it was a son that was here like on his 16th birthday. And I was just going down, they're like, can we go down with you? I said, sure. And so I had a spirit box going and I literally got to the top step. I took three steps down and it said, are you a friend? And I whipped around and I came right back up and I mean, I was stopped. And here was the dad and we were literally like nose to nose and he was like, what? And I'm like, I ain't nobody's friend down there, so. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm pretty That's certain they ain't that. mine. Yeah. And I will tell you too, this side of death row over here is a little bit darker. It's a little heavier feeling, but we also tend to get a large shadow figure over here on this side. Um, he is photographed quite frequently in here and seen quite often at the end yeah. of the hallway. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. the, yep. the wall that they broke through, uh -huh. where was that? For the riot? Yeah. Right okay. here. You see, before the paint started chipping, you could actually see. Well, you can actually yeah. you can still see it right here. Can you see how? Uh-huh. A little difference. Mm -hmm. So they just bust and so that and they went straight down the walk. Yep. And so why do you say that side is darker? Would there be any reason for that? No, because there should be. I mean, ooh, that's a good one. I, mean, all people that are here are I don't think it's any more like underground over on, you know what I'm saying? Because the, it doesn't like go at an angle or anything. But yeah, it's, it's a little bit darker over there. That was a perfectly timed question. Mm -hmm. like I said, why is it darker? <laughs> Well, <laughs> great question. So the end of the tour uh, meant one thing for us. We had to then be alone with the spirits and we all felt like they were waiting. I mean, they're everywhere in there. They're, they're the death and the violence in that prison is just spread out throughout the whole complex. So no matter where we really decided we were going to start, we were going to find something dark and something that wanted to speak with us. I mean, even the cop that came in, if you saw in that video footage, he had heard the banging and he came into the building because he thought we were in trouble. But we had heard the banging, we thought it was the cop. So uh, we all knew something was happening that night. And we were about to find out that that something was still there. Okay, everybody, so it's about 10.30 at night right now. We don't have the longest time in this prison. What an amazing tour we just had, wow. I mean, I think we're standing right now next to the dungeon, if you'll remember, where the inmates would bash their heads on the wall until they died. Um, just a horrific part of this prison's history, but I'm shocked by that door slamming sound. I mean, can you believe how loud and real that was? Confirmed by a cop who was in a different part of the building who also heard the same thing and came over because he thought something was wrong. As you can tell, it is really hot in here. I've sweat through my shirt like three times already <laughs> just doing the interview, so it's interesting. But I mean, you gotta imagine, this place is right next to a river. This place is right next to the train tracks. This place is built out of limestone and sandstone. And on top of all of that, if you follow paranormal theory, those three things, supercharged location, 
There are bodies that are probably still buried here that they never moved from the prison cemetery to the other burial ground. And on top of all that, there is a massive lightning and thunderstorm outside, which is once again, supercharging the energy of this prison. I just wanna say thank you to everybody who watches these videos because I remember back in 2017, to those of you who've been watching that long, um, I came to this prison and I took a tour of the place and I was like, wow, I couldn't even imagine being able to rent this place out someday. Tonight, we're here. So you guys have made one of my paranormal dreams come true and I cannot thank you all enough. If you love the channel, be sure to leave us a like on this video, hit the like button and comment. Let's go to prison in the comment section. We're giving away a free gift bag to one of the viewers. But anyways, enough about me. Jeff, how are you doing? My yes, I'm doing great. I'm hotter than hell. Um, it's been great. First time Connor, you and me together to do a prison. I mean, this place is freaking amazing. Like you guys saw the interview. I mean, you saw the expressions on our guide's face. That's been here eight years. The noises that we were hearing. So that for me was, and then, then I actually documented by the police officer that you see on tape. That's pretty cool, I think. But yeah, all the noises already that we've been hearing, this place is creepy. Thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of deaths, she said. So I'm ready to go. I mean, once again, let's go. And let's go say hi to okay. our third member tonight. Dun 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 like actual penitentiary that I've been able to do an investigation at. Super excited to be here. We've already gotten crazy evidence uh, and we haven't even started investigating per se, but also a little shameless plug. Yep. Check out the Murder in America merch, baby. This is a little sneak peek or not really a it sneak peek. Out, it's though, this, this is a sneak peek. Yeah, the, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is. Yeah, don't, whoa, 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 don't, wait a second. Whoa. Don't want to do that Family in here. Friendly, <laughs> come on. <laughs> but uh, thank you guys for watching. Uh, you're in for a treat tonight. Yeah, and also I don't know if this merch is going to be out yet, but if you don't listen to Murder in America, Courtney and I's podcast, make sure you listen to that. And how dope are these shirts, man? Super dope. Okay, guys, give I each other like a little high five or a hug or something. Say something cool. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys, let's do this. Well, okay, on man. three. One, two, three. Let's Stay do this. Okay. Oh, I oh. was. <laughs> we gotta start like yeah, playing out what we're gonna say know. after yeah, three. Because we're know. getting real bad what at that. <laughs> let's go. Let's go, mother. Die, mother. Die. Die, mother. Okay, to all of the prisoners here at the Missouri State Penitentiary, we are coming here tonight to speak with you. We are not prison guards, we are not prisoners, we are just normal people. Oh, I heard something. Right there, right next to you, Connor. Kenneth. Kenneth. Okay guys, so I have to stop this footage real quick immediately. I actually didn't know this until right now when I was editing this video, but one of the 40 people who was executed here at Missouri State Penitentiary's name was Kenneth. Kenneth Boyd. He was 23 years old. He shot someone and killed them during an armed robbery on January 13th, 1951. And he was executed on July 10th, 1953 in the gas chamber that we were headed to later that night. Was Kenneth potentially housed in this housing unit that we were in? Is his spirit still around there? I don't know, but it's a very, very bizarre connection that I couldn't exclude from this video. You looked up over here. Did you hear something back here? Yeah, I heard something behind me. Like a shuffling noise. I heard that noise as well. So thank you for showing us that you're here. I just want to introduce ourselves to, to you guys right now. My name is Colin. My name is Connor. I'm Jeff. And if you're here, could you give us a sign by walking towards one of these red lights that we have on the floor or by banging on something? 
or using your voice. Ted, please go left. Which left? Okay, which one was that? Do you want? Thank you for touching that red light, by the way. That's what we just asked. Yeah. Can you do that one more time? If that was you? Any of them? Oh, oh, oh! Thank you. Dude, none of the other ones. Oh, 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 it just walked towards you. Thank you. Okay, was that a sign that you want us to go that direction? You said go left. Interestingly, both are Connor's <gasps> left. Yeah. No to all. No to all. Could you make a sound for us? Where are you right now? Zachary. Two men's names, yeah. Kenneth and Zachary. If it's Kenneth or Zachary, can you come touch one of these red lights? We'd love to talk to you. Oh, oh, oh! Which one? Which one? These Both two, these. right next to us! <laughs> All right, okay, Kenneth so and Zachary, it's nice to meet you. Uh, can I just ask you, what did you guys do to end up in prison? I'm just curious, Kenneth or Zachary? Down at store. Store, store. Okay guys, so I'm a little bit freaked out. I just got goosebumps and started screaming while editing. So we didn't know the story of Kenneth at all before we filmed this video. We had no idea if that was an actual connection to the prison or not. We asked what this person did. It said store. So we assumed in the footage that they had robbed a store. Well, in reality, right there on the Missouri State Penitentiary website, they discuss how Kenneth robbed a store and a murder occurred, and that's why he was executed. So I don't know. I'm a little bit freaked out. I had no idea how relevant these answers were while we were there in the moment, but I just I think you can't deny that Kenneth at that point was actually with us. I mean, how bizarre is that connection? That's just uh that's wild and a little bit freaky. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Oh my god again. Dude, that one again too. This one right down there. It said go down. Oh go down. no. Go down. <laughs> Like, where should we go? Where should we go? To the dungeon, dude. Uh, you want us to go to the dungeon? Oh! Well, eventually we're gonna go. Oh, man. That's creepy looking. Do you want us to go down there, down the stairs? Can you make a noise wherever you want us to go? Oh, look at the cat ball right there, guys. Guys, cat ball right here. First time. Are you coming out of this cell door? Please believe us. Please believe us. Gregory. Gregory. Okay, we got a lot of men. A lot of men's names. If it's... Got all these... What the hell? What? Wait a second. Okay, but where's that pointing at? The cell? Oh, I mean, there goes the cat ball again. Okay, but that shouldn't go off with me here, right? I mean, no, it sure. can't. I can't find my way. I can't find my way. Jeez. I think the go down is like a, sh a sign. I yeah. think we need to go down to the dungeon. Right yeah. In front, In front of me. 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 What do we bring down? Look, everybody says that. Cat <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think it might be time to go down to the dungeon, guys. Wow. Ooh. Let's just bring the REM pods. Uh, like, I'm gonna grab one and then yeah. static. Both, okay. Followed us down. Can't here. hardly get set up before they go off. Jeremiah. Oh. Jeremiah, another male name. 
Dude, what is that thing doing? And that's right in front of the door over there. Yep. Oh. That's a, the other one. Oh. He's going nuts. What is that signal? Oh. You know what? I'm going to put the... Strangle. Put the strangle. strangle. Oh. I'm going to put this down here. You guys walking down here? What is happening? What's what happening? Ha yeah, it's like they don't. That's crazy to think with like what's happening, how they said it was like complete darkness and like it was disorienting to the people that were down here. But look at my life was short, Jeremiah and strangled. Witchcraft. Witchcraft. Okay. If you're down here in the dungeon, will you Make a noise for us. It's right there. Can you come walking down the hall and make that music box go off for us? That's called a music box, this little black coffin. Walk in front of it, please. Okay, can I ask? That's me and my feet. Can I ask? Who's down here? Can you tell us your name? Come, Infernal One. Come, Infernal One. Have you ever heard that? No. That's a bizarre. Come, come, Infernal One. So a lot of the viewers do come up with you know things in comments on these words or phrases. Right? Yeah. So if you need, if that makes sense, come infernal. And that sounds like almost a biblical thing yeah. to me. Oh well, yeah. <sighs> of course. It is. And right it said witchcraft said right before that. It's oh, almost like a yeah. ritual. Witchcraft come infernal one. True. Like summoning True. something dark. Wow. Come infernal one. Every time that we do a prison, it's f***ing dark mm -hmm. and evil. Yeah. It's not good. Like, you know, there's what good energy would be down here? I mean. Do you hear the Jasper. knock before? Jasper! I just asked for a name! Jasper! Did you hear the knock before that one started going? No. Okay, Jasper. We just asked for your name. I'm glad that you're here. If you see this red light over here, could you walk over to that one and touch it maybe? Yeah! Look at it said yeah, Jeff, zoom in on that. Look at that, get down on camera. Thank you, Jasper. That's crazy. <laughs> oh, dude, I got chills. Like dude, he's right there. Do you feel an energy shift right yeah. now? Yeah. Like straight up. And like a, a slight breeze now. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying, it's a breeze <laughs> in here. Okay, Jasper, um, what, what got you sent down to this part of the prison? Did you hurt somebody? Why were you being punished? I wanna, I wanna tell your story. Were the guards just being assholes? We heard the Catherine. We heard that sometimes well, the, remember, the officers were assholes to you. Remember they had she made a point of, remember? Women incarcerated down there. Remember that? Down here? Kind of forgotten about. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And it's like, which is this one? Give us a good, I, I don't want another name. Who, like what did you do? Did you hit someone? Did you smuggle something in here? Dude. Three o'clock, that's, is that, what's the witching hour? Three o'clock. Oh. Is it the witching hour? Three o'clock? Yeah, three o'clock. Witchcraft, that just went off when I asked it. Again, what did you do that made you incarcerated down here? 
Tell us what you did. Did you hear that? Yeah. Are you still here, Jasper? You can touch that thing again if you're still here. Did you? <gasps> Did you die here in this prison? We know a lot of people died down here and that the corrections officers were very mean. We know this was very tough down here for you and food was probably really scarce. What would you like to what did you like to eat? What was your favorite thing that you could have a food group on here? George. <laughs> George. Yeah, they're like eating George. Oh, <laughs> shit. Fucking George. Look, they eat Georgie Porgy pudding pie. There you go. Oh. There, see? Oh, my God, your voice scared me. Now, this is really unfortunate that we were laughing during this part just because... Jeff asked, what do you like to eat? And it said, George. We all thought that was funny. We were going a little crazy down there because it was so hot. But in reality, there were two inmates named George who were executed at the Missouri State Penitentiary in the gas chambers. There was George Bell, who was 35 years old when he died, who shot and killed a Kansas City, Missouri police officer and was executed on December 2nd, 1949. Then, in a strange twist, there's also George Tiny Mercer, the very last inmate to be executed at the prison, who we actually talked about on our tour. George Tiny Mercer was convicted for the assault and murder of a 22-year-old named Karen Keaton in Belton, Missouri, and he also had a charge against him of assaulting a 17-year-old girl when he was executed. The date that he died was January 6th, 1989. So sadly, we kind of glazed right over this, but this was a huge capture and I wanted to stop the video and point it out now because wow, how crazy is that? Maybe one of the Georges was with us down there. George, you poured your pudding pie. You like pudding? Let me ask, is there somebody down here? Why don't you come walk right up to me? You can come out of your cell. Do you not like it when people come down here? God, I'm so hot, man. So it's stifling. It's weird how those REM pods have stopped. I know. Going off. <laughs> Like, have they left here or? It feels kind of dead in here. Yeah. It kind of does. Is this the number four housing unit? <laughs> yeah, you're right. Is it? it is, this I is four, so. yeah. That just oh, said the number four right there. Okay, so. We have a lot of ground to cover here in this prison, off camera. We've just kind of been sitting here for, I'd say 30, 40 minutes. Nothing, no noises really. Some intelligent contact, but I definitely want to return back to the part of the prison where we were hearing those doors slamming with death row and the no man's land. And then that starts right yeah. when we're talking we're gonna, about leaving. Uh -huh. It was quite completely silent. But I think we should get going, don't you guys agree? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I feel like that's where we were getting, like, the most evidence before we had even yeah. brought out any gear. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you guys for talking to us. You can follow us over to Death Row if you want, but I don't know if that's a place you'd really want to go. <laughs> okay. Well... Let's head on over, man. So, the energy was definitely there in the first cell block that we went to. Um, we were getting pretty intelligent responses to things. It was just... Just for, like, the prisoners back in the day. No AC. So it was incredibly hot inside of there. So we decided that it was best for us to go on to the next spot in the location because we didn't have much time there. And so we headed over to Death Row. 
Okay guys, so we're currently in death row. This is the exact prison cell where the rat, if you remember in our history tour, was murdered with a sledgehammer. So his body would have been in this area right here. And guys, I already feel a whole lot different in here, don't you? Oh yeah. Yeah, I, the moment we stepped in here, I started feeling nauseous, faint, like almost like I'm, I'm gonna faint. And it's also hot as shit, so that's part of it. But um, it's just, if you remember, this is where earlier we were hearing those extremely loud bangs. Before we start using the dual port, I wanna just listen and see if we can hear anything. Okay, to anyone here on death row? We're here to talk to you. My name's Colin. Ooh. Oh, there goes the red flag right away. Did you just walk up to the cell? Remember they were talking about a moth? Yeah. Well, that's a sign of something. It's the sign that we had bright lights. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh god, dude, it's all the fucking on me. If there's anybody down here with us right now, can you make a noise so we know you're here? We know somebody was making noises up here earlier. Can you do it again? Come in the cell with us. We're going to try to let you talk through this box. So as many of you want to come in, come in. Oh. Keep coming. Okay, I'm just going to assume like they've, you know, some have come in, right? They're in here. Can you make a knocking noise like this? Anybody that's here, can you make a noise for us? Rattle a door, knock on anything for us, please. Just, we're here to make contact with you. We're friendly, please. Can you make that bang again for us? And that was like the exact sound that we were hearing earlier. You exactly, that's what's f***ing trick. Do you want to come out and hear more, or do you want to still stand there? Oh, that we, should do the, we should do the dual port, because yeah. I mean, okay. we still don't know where it came. Can you do that one more time?
Does this mean anything, or is that me? No. Oh, no, this... Look at this thing going on. Dude, that, that proximity meter just went off. That's on the lowest yeah. setting. Somebody just walked in the middle of us three. Cause like I didn't oh, dude, I got I, goosebumps, I, actually. I, I didn't move, man. I, that thing's going nuts. Oh. Dude, how all my hair is actually on end right now. I'm feeling like weird as shit. Me too. Okay, does, does that mean that you just came to, to speak with us in the cell? Oh, oh. Okay, I think we should. Okay, I think oh, now. Here. Yeah, let's, let's do, do the door work. Damn, this is scary, dude. This is, what is this room again? This, this is the room where the rat got. Oh, he got so bludgeoned with a sledgehammer. Talk to whoever's here on death row with us. Whoa! Oh, no. Was that from the box or from outside? I couldn't tell. I could. Yeah. That sounded like he came from the hallway. I'm on edge after hearing that. Thing. Yeah. <laughs> what the I keep that? like looking, checking my head. Um, can you tell us your name? <laughs> Say it. Walter? Can Walter? Just a tiny bit? Right here, cell number 23 was Walter Lee Donnell. And Walter Lee was a snitch. And you know, um, in this prison, as in any prison, snitches get stitches and end up in ditches. And they just make their way down. And so you think about Walter's down here somewhere. They're calling his name out. You know, we're coming to get you and that kind of thing. And they come on down and they stop right here. And there's a gentleman that's just hovering over in the corner there, you know, back to the cell door, and they're trying to get him to come up to the cell, and he won't budge, and they realize it's him. And so they take the keys, and they slide that cell door open, and they step in there with that sledgehammer, and they bludgeon him to death inside that cell. Um, I've heard other things, slit him uh, his throat from ear to ear, uh, you know, just... Whatever it was, it wasn't good. But the sledgehammer, we know that that did happen. So you've got six grown men um, that just bludgeoned him to death right, right in there. Can you say that clearer, please? What happened in this room? Were you killed during the riots? The past. Oh, that was really clear. What do you mean the past? What happened in the past? Evil. Evil. Yeah, I heard evil. Is there evil people here? Oh, okay. So your name was Walt. Why? Why were you in prison, Walt? Yes. I just have to say this again and stop the footage. We did not actually realize that Walter Lee Donnell was the man who was bludgeoned to death in that very cell with a sledgehammer. And it's just crazy to me that we had gotten his name, we went with this line of questioning, and we had no idea how relevant that was to the area we were investigating. I mean, right now I'm watching this footage and I'm just absolutely shocked by how many things we captured on our devices that we just didn't understand were so relevant. When you investigate such a massive place with so much history, it's easy to lose track of certain names. But I have to point this out and say it is so strange that we heard Walt when we asked for a name in the cell where a man named Walter was sledgehammered to death. I'm next. I'm next. I'm next. And this is death row. This is death row. It could be uh, someone waiting yeah. to be like an imprint, like someone waiting to be executed. That, that must be what they thought all day. I'm next. Yeah. Like, I'm next. Were you a death row inmate? 
You can tell us we're here just to communicate. We're friendly. Were you on death row? No. All right, guys, I have to stop the footage one more time because this is just so crazy. This is all stuff that I'm figuring out after the fact, after the investigation. So that response actually makes perfect sense because if you'll remember during our interview, Walter Lee Donnell was not actually on death row. He was in prison for a robbery charge and he was only placed on death row because he had snitched out other members of his robbery gang, which meant that he was never given a death sentence and no, he wasn't actually on death row. I mean, just wow, this stuff is mind blowing to me. Anyways, let's get back to it. What was the guy's name that was killed in here? Anybody remember? Ah, yeah. oh, shoot. What if it was Walter? I want to say his last name was something with a W. Is it on the cell? There's not a cell. Um, I think that it used to be. Yeah. But, okay. I mean, because he wasn't a death row inmate. He was kept here because oh, they were yeah. trying to keep him safe. Oh, that's right. This is like the safest area in the prison because it's yeah. the highest security. Right. Uh, here. 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 Can you tell us what happened to you? Hung? Hung? Yeah, it, it sounded like. Oh. oh. Don't. Is there something evil here? Can you tell me why you were in this cell? Prisoner. Oh my god, that's clear. Prisoner, I thought. Were you in the cell to be protected? That's what we heard. Is that true? Spirit, I thought I heard it say. You're kind of giving us mis mixed messages. Like, what, what ended you up in this prison? Did you murder someone? Did you hurt somebody? Prison. What was that? What? That voice. <coughs> oh, what? Oh, here. Right when I, I thought I heard a voice from out there. That's when I went out. out. That's, when, yeah, that's what I was saying. So you're still here. Is there a reason why you won't come in this cell and talk to us? Can you tell us where we should go next? Where there might be some spirits that want to talk? Yes. Okay, where is it? First. First. Sound like first. I heard first. I'm not getting any sort of. Should we do a DR60? Yeah, yeah, let's yeah, do that. Let's do that. Put my hair up. Do you have the DR60 with it's you? Yes. Oh, oh. So you have your. Are you rolling? Yep. Very good. Like it, it's like it wants us to do the DR60, okay? Do DR60 and then go yeah. down? Yeah. Maybe we just go down and just like bring the cameras only. No equipment. And just listen. Just bring DR60. DR60. Yeah. You can do Wanna just do that now? Yeah. We gotta put on our costumes. So we were receiving extremely intelligent contact throughout the entire night. Now, this wasn't as active as other places we've been to and we were kind of rushed because we had a tight time limit um, inside of the prison that they granted us access to. It was just freaking me out the entire time because the energy in there is so oppressive, so bad. And I don't know, if something can bang on a metal cell that hard, it's kind of scary to think about what something like that could do to the human body. I mean, could it break your bone? People have been slapped that I know, I've been scratched. People have been shanked, attacked, pushed downstairs. What can a ghost really do to you? If it is a ghost, I guess. But we had to put all those fears aside and head down to the most notorious part of the prison where even the guides won't investigate at night. 
No Man's Land, right beneath Death Row. Hey everybody, it's Colin here. So as I teased yesterday on the channel, we are dropping merch for the first time in I think like a year and a half. This time it's different. We actually had all this merch printed here in Houston, Texas, where we live. We are gonna be shipping out everything by ourselves and it's so high quality. So let me show you what we got here. First of all, we have the Paranormal Files Spooky Ghost Tee just in time for Halloween. This was hand drawn by a really good friend of mine, Kat, and it's printed on comfort colors. And if you've ever worn a comfort colors shirt, I have to tell you, I'm wearing one right now. It is one of the most comfortable things you'll ever wear. I mean, definitely the highest quality shirt that we could pick out. It was actually the most expensive, so we lost money on that end of everything, but we wanted to give you guys the best shirt that we could possibly give you. So this shirt is now live on our new merch store. The link is gonna be in the description of this video. We're only selling 150 of these shirts, and then once they're out, they're completely gone. So. So you should get them now before they run out of stock because like I said, we're not gonna be restocking these. We're gonna be moving on to different drops every month or two months. But we're not only doing merch for the Paranormal Files, we're also doing merch for Murder in America, our first official merch drop for the podcast that Courtney and I co-host. So we have the logo tee, which is our official logo from the podcast you see when you listen on all platforms. And then these are my favorites. We have the two goth print, uh, I don't know if you'd call it a colorway or whatever you'd call it, but we have a white and a black, both with the red Murder in America logo that I designed. And uh, yeah, they're all printed on comfort colors. In each of these shirts, there's only 50 printed of each. So those are even more limited quality. But, but like I said, we're gonna be doing new drops every month or two months. We have another drop coming at the end of October that we're really, really excited for that ties into our documentary that we've been working on for months. But yeah, this is, I think, the perfect way to celebrate Halloween. As soon as you get your order, we're gonna try to ship them out by the end of the week. So yeah, you, you guys should be able to get these in time for Halloween for spooky season. And Connor, how high quality is this? You just tell me. The highest of qualities. Yes. Ooh. Ooh. Ah. Ah. <laughs> no, honestly, guys, we put our heart and soul into this. Uh, me and Colin will personally be shipping all these out and uh, we're gonna do the first 10 orders. We're gonna do a little note for you guys. Yeah, so, a little sign, sign yeah, signature. But uh, super cool shirt. I mean, you've seen us wear them in the videos. Super comfy shirt for fall time. That's amazing. So, yeah. We're also in the new podcast studio. Just oh, got yeah. this thing set up. We got some more news coming out, but oh, yeah. so can't I, talk about that no, yet. No, no, no. Secret, <laughs> secret. For Murder in America. Or Paranormal Files. Well, give them a stay spooky and let's get back to the damn stay episode. Stay spooky. Okay. Peace. <laughs> so right now we're headed down to the criminally and mentally insane wing here in the penitentiary. And if you'll remember guys, this is the area where earlier today we were hearing those banging noises. So we're gonna do a DR60 down here. And like I said, we don't have the most time here at the prison. We're lucky to have what we've got, but. Should we sit here? Yeah, sure. Oh, there. Oh, breeze right here. Okay, to whoever's down here. <laughs> I think we were hearing you earlier with the banging and the noises that you were making. But we're coming down here right now to talk to you. So if you could please make more noises, slam the doors again, and use your voice to chat with us. That would be amazing. Could you tell us your name loudly and clearly? How did you die? In the summer, was it really hot here? If, if so, say like hot or fire or something like that. Did you have any friends down here? Why do people get scared when they come down here? Is it because it was a really bad place to be sent for punishment? Were you in a gang? What building number are we in right now? 
Is there a specific part of the building that you're in right now? Are you here? What do you see? Do you see the prison walls or do you see something else? I'm just curious. Did the corrections officers here hurt you? You had a lot of time here. What did you do in your time that you enjoyed? What sort of hobby or activity did, did you do? I would kill to hear that noise again. Seriously. It's crazy that happened. It really does. I mean, we caught it enough times where it scared the shit even out of our tour guide. But I mean, it's 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 probably the best thing that we've got right now. Oh, wow. I mean, and then the cop coming in. Yeah. And then he confirmed that he heard that noise, and then heard us heard her say that. Can you tell us your name loudly and clearly? Think about it, it's like it's coming and it's going right now. We heard that bang upstairs, some loud voices, but it's just not telling like a consistent story. So what does that mean? I mean, there's so many souls here, it seems like, that just are all coming through. Well, I mean, it's, there's not just one story to this place. There's when 10, you When you have 5,000 inmates at one point on this property, there's gonna be Thousands and thousands and thousands of stories. I mean, there's at least 5,000 people that have died on property here. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you're not just going to have one story because everybody here committed their own crime. Yeah. But just think if they had six people yeah. in a cell like this. That's six insane. men that could be two murderers, two petty thefts. They didn't remember, they didn't really break them apart. Mm -hmm. All living and six stacked in there, and it's hot. I mean, I couldn't imagine the brutality down here. I say, let's do one more here. Sixty. Let's go walk down to no man's land. There. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's the spot. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So since we want to kind of get a taste of all of this this property, like I said, limited time tonight. Um, we're gonna head down to no man's land now. This is the part of the prison where psychics, tour guides, they all refuse to go into alone. They don't really understand why it's so evil and there's this like extreme negativity here, but it's here and yeah, it's right here. DR60 in this cell right here. You guys ready? Yeah. Okay. We're here to ask you a question right now. Who is the person who haunts this area? Were you 
assaulted in this cell? Anybody? What happened to you? What did you do to make you end up down here? Were you on death row? Okay. That's right there. Definitely someone here. I think we do one more right away. Yeah, just do so, have much time. Okay, so there is somebody here. Let me ask, why are you so negative and why are people scared of you? Did you kill someone? Are you alive or dead? If you know, are you alive or dead? Let me ask you. What what is the issue that you have? Are you angry that you're trapped here? Could you move something down here, slam a door, knock on something before we go? Do you not like that we've been going in your cells? What do you miss the most on the outside before you got imprisoned? What do you miss the most? Ooh. I hear the REM pods going off. I just heard the REM pods going off upstairs. Damn, you must have like bad yeah, like, hearing. I swear, I just heard the hearing over there. <laughs> okay. Guys, it's 1226. Okay. We gotta get back there. Okay. 
Okay guys, so we're officially out of time here at the main portion of the penitentiary, but we have a very, very macabre ending for this video. For the first time ever here on the channel, we are getting access to the execution chambers at a penitentiary where over 40 people were killed by their own government. So we are going to head there now, check it out, and finish up with our Estes session. And I am a little bit freaked out to do it in there if we're gonna be honest. She said, remember, you can hear stuff? I'm still rolling. You weren't, you, you weren't too close. Oh, my. There's no way. It's 10 feet away from me. Oh. oh yeah, Thank you for, dude. It's like they came out of the cell. Oh, like, what are you doing? Did the light change or no? I, I can't tell. Look at it went off on the other side. Oh. So does that mean that you, <coughs> Are you sad that we're leaving? <sighs> Sorry. What the hell? We were just about to pack up. I was just rolling in case something. Did you not like that we came back in here? I don't like the we're in here. Okay, well. Okay, see you later. Oh! <laughs> Thanks for that so much. Thank you, whoever you are, even though we don't know who you are. That's really shot. weird. Yeah. It's not in the shot. Barely. Oh, I'm still sit here and see it. Okay. 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 Well, let's pack up and head to okay. the yeah, I'm Hey everybody, it's Colin here. Thank you for watching today's video. Hello to all the new subscribers and hello to the rest of our beautiful, wonderful, spooky family. As you know, every single week here on the channel, we give away a free gift bag to one lucky viewer of the show. And this week to enter the contest, all you have to do is like today's video, let's smash that like button and comment, let's go to prison in the comments section below. I'm gonna give you all 10 seconds to do this now. 10, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. So go comment, you can comment multiple times. It helps the video so much. But anyways, let's get back to today's video. Thank you for listening to my little spiel. I love you guys so much and stay spooky. So No Man's Land, uh, where we're hearing the banging noises from before, uh, it still had some energy to it, but it definitely wasn't even remotely close to what it was before. It almost like it walked out of there. Like maybe the presence that we were feeling early might have been like a warden or one of the corrections officers there and leaving out of that place. I mean, we weren't really sure, but it just didn't feel the same as it did before. So we decided to go where that spirit might have ended up, to the death chambers. So we did execute uh, 40 individuals in our gas chamber, and 39 of those were by lethal cyanide gas, which was a gruesome way to die. It took three to five minutes uh, for those individuals to actually succumb to that uh, type of uh, killing. They would have had last meals and last rites in their cells, and then they would have been driven down here um, by the warden in a state-issued vehicle. Walk the path right here. Um, that's about as close to dead man walking as you're ever gonna get right there, Colin. So um, step, step lightly. And then uh, after the national moratorium on the death sentence uh, in 1965 went away, and each state was allowed to vote whether or not they wanted the death sentence to return. Missouri said, yes, we did. And we did uh, George Tiny Mercer, who I mentioned to you up on uh, death row. He was the only one we did by lethal injection and the last one we did at all here. And then we moved him out to Potosi. Now of those 39 that we gassed, one of those was a woman. Her name was Bonnie Brown Hetty. Uh, no one had ever executed a woman um, before that. This was in December of 1953 uh, when she was executed. She and her lover, Carl Estenhall, committed the Bobby Greenlee's kidnapping in Kansas City. Uh, we ended up executing uh, the both of them side by side. We do have two chairs. We did double executions four times uh, over the years. So there was no waiting here. You know, it was pretty swift justice back in the day. In fact, those two sat on death row 81 days before they were brought down here and executed. And Missouri still holds the national record for the shortest amount of time that everybody, anybody ever sat on death row before, before execution and it was them. Yeah, see, everybody <laughs> thinks it's the Arch in St. Louis. Uh-uh, it's this. So you can either take the path 
or we do have a couple of stairs over here, whichever way you would prefer to go. The they would have went that way. Exactly. I'm on that go, path. I'll, you, go, all right. I'll go that way with you. I mean, dude, can you imagine? 40 Jeez. people executed. Yeah, in this and, small and, and actually think of them. Like, think of them actually, if you were in the moment with them and they're walking here. This is the last thing like, they ever To gas, saw. to get gassed. Like the worst way. And then look at there's a cross here. Oh. Cross. Uh, it was actually asked for to be put in by the inmates. Um, and, you know, I guess you got to get right with God before you go in if you haven't gotten right already. So the right hand side is the chamber side, and that is where the actual chairs are located. Oh my God. They actually poured the pad, the concrete pad, brought in um, the canister part, the chamber part, set it in place, and then they built the building around it. And I mentioned that the three limestone buildings up above that we went into um, were hand built by the inmates. Well, this building's also made out of limestone, so who do you think built it? the inmates. So they are actually building the gas chamber that, uh, you know, 39 of them were killed in. So they held in here? This was, I guess you could call it a holding cell. You know, again, back in the day, by the time they got brought down here, everything pretty much was done up there. Like I said, last meals and last rites. They may have held them in here for a very short amount of time. I mean, maybe waiting for state witnesses or press or something like that to arrive. But I would imagine within the hour, um, it was starting. And average death row uh, inmate in our facility was 2.4 years uh, before they were brought down here. So again, you know, they didn't remain there for 15, 20 years, sometimes life, I'm waiting on death row for execution. This is, this is the 40 individuals, yes, uh, including the last one that was by lethal. And the way they actually did him, they unbolted the two chairs took them outside, just set them outside, rolled him in on a gurney. They said his feet actually stuck out because um, the gurney was too long, executed him by lethal, rolled him out, put the chairs back in, bolted them down, and then we never used it again after that. There is a mirror in there that was put in place strictly for him, uh, for him to see his wife, who he met and married on death row, by the way, uh, and somebody else um, that was in a, a special room back here that was watching that execution. Otherwise, everybody stood over on that side, which was the viewing side, and um, that included state witnesses, press, uh, both, families, so the families being of the individuals being executed and the family of the victim um, who might have been involved in the crime. They literally stood in there together, which was very awkward if you ask me. Uh, but then they um, neutralized using an ammonia compound, which is what these orange uh, canisters are, and there's more on the other side of the neutralization process. Ran about 45 minutes to an hour to neutralize the cyanide gas. It was still in the, in the chamber area and then they would shoot out the residue, whatever was remaining out the 40 foot smokestack that's um, on top. The red lever over here behind Cooper, um, that is what actually dropped the trays that held cyanide tablets that are under the chairs in there. Uh, the tray dropped and the cyanide tablets slid off into crocs um, that were under the chairs containing sulfuric acid and warm water and that's what started releasing the gas. And then the gray lever is what opened the smokestack and uh, suck the residue on out. The warden is the one who actually, you know, dropped the handle. We didn't have like an executioner or anything like that. So, you know, if you were a warden in the early days, you may have done this uh, multiple times. Yeah. And again, you know, they just received orders and carried them out and did what they were supposed to do. It, they could not take any of a personal or they would not be able to complete the job. So when we do get anything, any type of activity, which I have caught a really good EVP from over on the other side. A couple of other EVPs have been caught in here. We've heard banging in here before. Um, it, it's big when it happens. So it's not that small random stuff like we get up there by the, uh, you know, the boatload down here. It's, it's minimal, but it's big when it happens, so. So I have one question. Sure. What was it like to die by the gas? What happened? It, it was almost, you know, you are, are taking it in internally first thing. You're just breathing it in. And it literally is just burning you from the inside out. Um, it, it was a gruesome way to die. Three to five minutes again for them to succumb to that gas. And that entire time, 
you know, every nerve ending in their body is on steroids. They are feeling every bit of that pain the entire time until it's over with. Yeah, it was not a pleasant way to go. No. I don't know if there's any pleasant way, but I that one... Um, it was just extra unpleasant. It, it, it most certainly was. It most certainly was. Knife in the wound, salt in the wound, you know, knife, yeah, just twisting it, making it even worse. injection now and they... Give you a set if they yes. knock you out it, first it, it, and then take quick, you out. Yeah, stops your heart, stops your heart it yeah. paralyzes you. And is it foolproof? No, absolutely yeah. not. We know that. But right. again, I think it would have been better than this. Oh, yeah. yeah. It was just, it was a prolonged um, agony pretty much the whole time while you have people watching. And they were masked um, when they were gassed, so they weren't allowed to, or not allowed, but there was no reason to look for loved ones because they couldn't see anybody anyway. It just would be filled up with like a, an opaque gas. It, 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 yes, um, almost uh, odorless, colorless. In fact, the warden, um, before the process would have started, would have told the individual or individuals he would bang on the tank three times as a signal that the gas was reaching their faces because of course they're blindfolded, you know, they can't see anything anyway. And they could breathe in deeply, they would succumb quicker. Most of them listened, you know, and did exactly that, just breathed in as deeply as they could so they could, you know, hopefully end it quicker. So what made them choose gas? Cyanide, good question. Um, before that, uh, before gassing, all executions in the United States were done in the county they were committed in by public gallow hanging. Mm -hmm. We had a public gallow here. Uh, the last uh, execution we did by hanging, I believe, was in like 1936, the year uh, before we did our first gassing, and 20,000 people showed up. I mean, they had turned into public spectacles, you know, people were bringing their children, let's dress in our Sunday best and go watch the hanging, and they were bringing picnic baskets, you know, and have lunch, and officials were like, okay, you know, we really can't do this anymore, this is not good at all, not a good setup. So, they enacted the lethal um, gassing, and again, they probably would have continued with the gassing, but there was the national moratorium on the death sentence, which was nation nationwide, it was gone in 65. Um, and it was gone for, you know, I don't know how many years, but into the 70s before, you know, they brought it back out. Maybe even later than that. I'm not sure. But And then when they came down to test it, you know, after we said we do want the death sentence in Missouri, they threw smoke bombs in here, and it was a darn good thing they did because it leaked like a sieve. You know, it had been setting for 15, 17 years by now, not being used. Uh, seals are, are ruined and that kind of thing and they would have gassed everybody in the building if they would have not tested that beforehand so and then it took them several more years to you know get the lethal injection on the books because we know um you know judicial systems don't work real quickly so yeah okay. yeah so shall we check out the other side and see the viewing side of things and see how it looked from that end I said again, it's just like, you know, you're like in a fish bowl and you're just watching. I, I don't know. I mean, it's easy to say. I don't think I would want to have watched, but I guess if it was your loved one that, I don't know. I, you know, it's hard to say. So here you can see the other two tanks with, for the ammonia, a neutralization compound. I believe this is bulletproof glass. I think I have heard. Um, and they had a perfect bird's eye view. Now up until George Tiny Mercer, they just stood in here, so you know, there could have been, depending on how many were here, maybe, you know, 10 dozen people or so. A lot of families back then, I don't know how many of them actually were able to make the trek. You know, a lot of these guys that were here, necessarily their homes were not even in the state of Missouri, and it was expensive to travel back then. And let's be honest, most of the guys that were doing time in here, their families probably didn't have the money to travel. So I don't really know how many of them's families actually arrived. That's probably something I should look into and see. Uh, the risers were put in for Tiny. Uh, he had quite the outpouring of people that came uh, to watch. You know, that was in 1989. I remember that very well. I was a grown, you know, woman by then. And it was a pretty big deal to have that happening in Cole County. Well, that tends to happen. <laughs> Damn, that just died? Right here. Tends to happen. So, 
um, but they put the risers in specifically for him so they actually could just sit here and wow. watch this execution. Yeah. I wonder how much they like move, you know, like shake or anything like that. Do you know? I don't know if we know because I don't know if anybody's even alive anymore to be able to tell us those kinds yeah. of details. I'm sure, I mean, I can't imagine that, yeah. right? I mean, even you could Google, I mean, Google sign, I'm guessing it's going to tell you. Right. I'm curious. I've sure. done it several yeah, times. Yeah, cyanide doesn't work on Jeff. My wife has tried. Over and over. <laughs> yeah. But no success. But convulsing, uh, I'm foaming at the mouth. I mean, it was poison, so it would be any type of um, effect. You'd have the same thing, only, like I said. It just seems so brutal. It was. And, and like, just, hanging is so much more tame and, most of the time. Yeah. Even, like, firing squad. Uh, see, I've always said that'd be my choice. Yeah. If I could make sure. a choice. I think just close range, though, yeah, it yeah. should just be... Make sure it's somebody who yeah. can shoot them, please. Because <laughs> knowing me, I'd get someone who'd grace yeah, right. me. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Line up. Uh, no, my luck was everybody oh, would get yeah. blanks, oh, like, yeah. six times. Oh, and I'm just sitting there like, come on. Don't anybody peek as to who's but, um, uh, yeah. Here we are joking about people <laughs> Don't you have to? I mean, when you're in here. I mean, it's not, they know we don't mean any disrespect yeah, at all. No. They get it, but yeah. we right. just can't wrap our minds around it. So, all right, well, I'm just going to step out. You all can okay. do a We're little bit a little in here. Well, I'm going to have to ask oh, you to leave. It's man. one of my favorite. I'm gonna have to ask you to leave. <laughs> well, wait. I guess. Down. I guess. The, I guess the alternative could be having to stay. Yeah. yeah. True. True. I'll leave. Yeah, we got another outfit for you to put on. Come on. Head down. Head down. I'm pretty sure I've been in one before. The old. No. 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 Okay, guys, so to end tonight's investigation, we have something absolutely crazy that we have access to. The gas chambers where 40 people were executed here at the penitentiary. We have never had this opportunity here on the show, and already the energy in there is heavy, it's thick. It just feels so wrong knowing how many people were killed in such a terrible way there. They suffered. Right? But as you can see, I have a police uniform on. We have a criminal here and we have another police officer right here. <laughs> we're gonna try to do an experiment here. So we're gonna handcuff Connor and we're gonna lead him into the gas chamber exactly like the prisoners who were executed were let in there before they died in an effort to see if using these costumes, these outfits might bring out some of the energy that is obviously still trapped there from the horrific things that happened. Yeah. Are you? Aren't you a little bit nervous? I'm kind of freaked out. I mean, this, I, mean, I mean, it's like the people that got executed here. I mean, they they weren't good people. No. But still, I mean, everybody's human, and nobody deserves to suffer like that when they die. It's kind of like sad, but I mean, yeah. It because it's even like emotion, like emotional energy that might still be trapped there from the families yeah. uh, who like lost someone because they got murdered, or even like the people who committed the crimes like they still had families yeah and so they were still people and so i mean there's a lot of emotional energy that's like still in that building well when you use the estes method you are trying to invite an energy kind of into you and when you do it in a place like this where murderers were killed it's just frightening yeah so you act like you've never done this before <laughs> okay you need retraining <laughs> Okay. Connor Shannon, you have been sentenced to death by the state of Missouri. Do you have any final words? No, I'm gonna die. We'll see about that. <laughs> okay, well. So, you can pause that. So we wanted to treat this with respect, obviously. We've never had access to a death chambers of any sort, but it was just so, so crazy. We wanted to do an experiment to see if us dressing up and recreating something like an execution would bring out any of this energy. And after looking back at the footage like we have now, it definitely brought it out to play. F man, this is dark. 
yeah. could be the darkest thing we've ever done. Yeah, we gotta do our duty, man. Yeah. This guy's done some bad things. Yeah. You've been sentenced to die. You're about to die. These are your last words. Tell us your name. A. A? A what? Can you tell us your name? What'd you do? Did you did you murder somebody? Cabinet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Bomb. He said, mm-hmm. So you killed someone? You killed. Oh, oh. Photos. Photos. Maybe they don't like that we're cops in here telling us to leave. Could be. We took we were taking photos. That's dude. Yeah. Dude, we were taking photos. Yeah, we are. We were. Yeah, we're still Oh yeah, we were just we were taking photos. photos on our phone. They don't like it. Did you die from the gas? Or lethal yeah. injury? Oh, okay. What hurt? How did you die? Gas or lethal injection? Did you breathe something? There's like a noise. Like there's a weird burning right now. There was a there's movement, movement behind him. him. I don't know what the hell that was. Um, tell me more about what you did to end up in the gas chamber. Did you kill one? Go. No. no, we're not going to go. You have to die. But we want to. Maybe we can get you out of here if you tell us something about what happened. Did you kill multiple people? Wealthy. Maybe robbed them? Well, killed, killed wealthy, wealthy people. people. Maybe. So like a robber. Yeah. You know? Yeah. For you. Yeah. Doll. Flower. Her money. <gasps> okay. Okay, so wealthy you wealthy. killed people for money. So you, that makes sense. I'd say the people that you killed were wealthy. If they were wealthy. Just keep that in mind. So where, like, yeah. where did this happen? What part of the country are you from? Like, north, south, east, west? Can you tell me as oh, oh, okay. I would say that would be north. 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 From okay. Missouri. So the north. Okay. That would be kind of us. Yeah. How did you end up in Missouri, if you're from the north? Got away. Got away. Had to. Oh. Oh, so had committed a crime, that fucking is insane actually, what this is it? insane, that got, away. got away, had to get away I'm assuming, got away with a crime, or had, or had to get away, Scary. adventure, adventure, or had to get away from uh, where they committed the crime in the north, yep. oh, <laughs> okay. so do you know that you were dead? So, I don't think who they kill. Yeah. Wealthy. Okay, um, did you kill like a number of people that were wealthy or just a few? Gary! Gary? Like you. Like me. Like me. Okay, like me? Cops? Cops. Cops. Ooh. Ooh. Cops. A cop connection. Yes. So you. So you killed cops and wealthy people. That's what you did. That's interesting. Cops <laughs> and wealthy people are connected. The child wants help. Okay, so let's think about it. North killed people like young. us. I was young. Okay, younger person. Cops killed maybe or whatever, a connection. Yeah. And wealthy That's people. All I knew. Up north. Up north. I have to look up people. What Where did, am I? Can you what, tell? What did you do for like what? What did you do for a living? Well, they killed wealthy people. Killed Maybe police. a policeman. Okay, so I'm like feeling disgusting right now. Okay, so I think oh, he looks. I think good. like okay. I heard a bang. Yeah. They're super tight. Okay, we're just gonna keep going here. Yeah. yeah. 
So what what year were you executed in? Free. Free. Is free maybe it's after free. dying? 30. 1930? Or he was 30. 30 years old. Were they doing it? When did they start the lethal mm. gas? Oh. Okay, so let's go back okay, so and thirty is either thirty or something to do with thirty north of Missouri. Like Nebraska or something like that, right? Or what's uh, north of Oklahoma? Yeah. No, I don't even know damn. What's my geography? What was what was your last <laughs> Nebraska? <laughs> yeah, Nebraska. Uh, could be Minnesota. Illinois, South Dakota, could Minnesota, be South Dakota, North Dakota, North Dakota Wyoming, Wyoming, Montana. Montana. And we were just could be someone that followed us from Montana too. <laughs> What did you what did you kill people with? How did you kill them? Did you shoot them? Did you put a knife in them? Like a Christine. knife knife or Christine. Can't breathe. Okay. Okay, okay, I would think to me that would be maybe strangul strangulation. Well, or the gas chamber. Oh, true. <laughs> but I asked them like how they kill people. Did you strangle people? Can't breathe. I have a feeling if you killed a cop then you'd shoot him. Well you could shoot him in the lung. And they couldn't breathe. You know? Oh, uh, yeah. God. It's higher and shit. So. Oh. What the f? Okay. okay. I don't know if it's just that it's hot in here, but I, like, I feel like I'm getting like, sick. Mm. Yeah, probably. Well, he might be going through the actual gas chamber. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. I mean, I can only imagine, like, what the. No, come on. No, oh, that's gotta be something. It's me. Do you hear that? Yes. What the f? What the f? Dude, is that something that just like banged on the side of the Yes. Did you just bang on something? It's me. That's what it's looking for, too. So it's me. So why do you stick around in the in this area? Is there more than one person here? It could be more than one person. It might be. So we still have a lot of Cop. a lot of clues here. Cop. Uh, what? Cop killer, robber, cop, killing cop. South. Um, and thirty. South. Thirty. Thirty was a big one. Thirty. Up south. What? Up south. Up south. I'm gonna take that as like south. Up though, south. So like, now totally different area. Like, you mean wow. like Texas and all that? Up. True. <laughs> up, up, up from Missouri. What, what did it feel like to die? Fire. Well, that's, it was this is like, tall to her. What'd she just say? Like it's like you burn yourself oh, up inside. Oh, she did just say that. Well, I, yeah, I know. I've read about what it felt like, and that's mm -hmm. exactly what it was like. Window. Window. <laughs> push it. Oh. Or push it like almost pull it. Dude, are, is there somebody watching from the window right now? Window. I meant to say push it. Yeah. Like somebody. Nobody wants, cares. Like somebody wants you to do it. Yeah. I mean, we just heard a bang from over there by the f***ing window. Okay, I wonder Is there somebody watching this execution? I wonder when you pull the lever, right? Yeah. Then what happens when, when you push it? They hate me. Well, that would make yeah. sense. Well, yeah. People that you killed their families. Okay, we got a lot of stuff that's narrowed here. Um, I think you should make sure and write this down on all these things. Yeah, I want to go research. Because we've got exactly. like 40 people yeah. to try to figure out maybe who we're talking to. But there's no details about anything. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, have to look. have to read. You got Allen. That's a name. <coughs> Granville Allen. What's that? Kind of rich head. So a person, person that would be... These guys are 40s. There's Cross. 38, 38. 30? Yeah, 38. Really? Okay, what's, what's that? I'm just trying to find A names from the 30s. Oh, you know, we should have. Dude, I found really weird 
dude. I'm, I'm freaking out of it. I'm, I'm getting like dizzy myself. I think Connor's probably not like feeling good. I don't know if he's really doing too good. You no. know what I'm saying? No. I think he's giving the effects of the cyanide gas, like a little living in me. Me too. Do you think you want to go? Do you feel like you're dying? Bodies shutting down from the yes, yeah. or we need to shut down. Soldier. Soldier. Oh. Well, we're gonna research and kind of look into who you might have been. That's a lot of info. Yeah. Can you? Do you have anything else you want to tell us? Dude, Connor's kind of slumping over. I think maybe we better let him get, Sorry. get out of the suit. That's really sad, actually. Yeah, really. Hey, did you ever feel bad about whatever you did? Do you think you're in heaven now? Are you stuck here? Or... Anything you want to... Jeremy. Bar. What? Bar? Well, Jeremy. That could be a bar, like right here. Bar? Bar, bar here. Do you say bar or car? Bar. Dude, you need, you need to write down Jeremy, Jeremy. too. Is, is there anything else you could tell? Or like, what? Why are, why are you still here? Yeah. I'm scared. I don't know. I don't know. Anything else? I'm glad you're here. Oh, okay. Do you like that we're telling your story? <laughs> I mean, if, if he's stuck here, right? Yeah. He's been here for a long time. God, what the f um, I just want to know, like, any, tell me something about the day you died. He looks like he's like dead. He There's died. bad energy. He's dying. There's bad energy. Wow. There is bad Ever energy. Ever since I got in here, I just felt like. I don't know if there's like a just super heavy feeling in here. Like it, it doesn't feel like there's just like one thing. It's like, it feels super emotional. Well, I think we've gotten some yeah. really good stuff. I, do. I think it's so freaking hot in here. We should probably. All right, this is your last chance to say something to us. Do you have anything left to share? You can say it through the necrometer or the spirit talker or yourself. Anything further? It's just like, get out of here. Well, I mean, let's just go. Shut down. Okay. Let's get out of here. That's your revolution button go. That was, that was crazy. Okay, everybody. Ooh. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Huh? Right. He's hurt so bad. Sorry. He did good, man. He had a lot of good stuff. That's like, that was probably the most uncomfortable SS session I've ever done. Really? Why? I don't know. I just like felt like sick the whole time I was in here. And like, like I felt like the whole time I just kind of like wanted to cry. I don't know. Well, let's get you out of here, man. I'm gonna pause this. We can do our wrap up thoughts later. That Estes method, I feel like definitely stuck with me. Just being in a place where people were, for lack of better words, they were murdered in there. Uh, it wasn't a fast, painless death. This was brutal execution. I feel like that kind of left an impact on me that uh, I'll never be able to shake. It was dark. But also, you have to think about the crimes that a lot of these people committed for being on death row. I mean, they weren't good people. But I believe that I came in contact with a specific person there. So it seemed like we had been talking to the spirit of Adam Ricchetti. And although he never actually said his name out loud, um, and obviously there was a lot of Estes stuff that I cut out um, that was just random, but those were the clues that I included in the video footage that seemed to link us to this guy.
So there are a couple of reasons why I believe we were talking to a man named Adam Ricchetti. Now, Adam was a career gangster who ran with people like Pretty Boy Floyd. And interestingly enough, he was executed for the murder of a police officer. And if you'll remember during our Estes, it seemed like the spirit didn't really like the police, but he kept talking about them. There was also a point when Connor said up south, and then our device said true after I mentioned Texas. Well, Adam was born in Texas. And pretty quickly at the beginning of the session, we were able to determine that he was a robber. Now, it seemed like Adam's spirit didn't really want to speak with us, and that would make sense because a lot of modern historians think that Adam actually wasn't guilty of murdering anybody and the courtroom was stacked against him with crooked cops who were willing to lie to get a conviction. I should also mention at the very beginning of the Estes, Connor said A, which could stand for Adam, but I don't know. What do you guys think about all of this? Just crazy that, I mean, I never thought in my wildest dreams that we'd actually be able to take what we had gathered that night and apply it to some historical research and find a guy that it seemed to match, but we did. I mean, the crime spree, lines up perfectly with what we were told during the Estes, the name, kind of everything about it. So, I don't know, I really do feel like we contacted Adam and it would it's just crazy to me that he would still be there after so many years. It just goes to show, I think, that executions and stuff like that leave such a brutal, bloody mark on the buildings that they're carried out in. Um, you can wash the blood off of a wall, but the energy will stain it forever. Okay guys, so it's now the next day and I wanted to take you to, to this cemetery here in Jefferson City. Do you guys know why I brought you guys here? Kill me? <laughs> no. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> no. Any idea? Do you see any big memorial, any anything around here? Well, this is where the prisoners from the Missouri State Penitentiary were reinterred. Hundreds, if not thousands of bodies were moved to this small cemetery. They were given no marking and they're all buried here in unmarked graves. So this would include people that were murdered by another inmate serving, you know, even a petty charge, people that took their own lives that would have eventually gotten out of prison and the inmates that were executed. And I personally think it's shocking that they don't have even a sign denoting where these people are, you know? That's kind of crazy. Hmm. Look at it. And it's a pretty full cemetery. Yeah. I mean, the only place that's not filled is right here. That would fit a lot of bodies down there. I know, that's what... I mean, it looks well, how like how else would they there. put them in here, you know, right? I mean, you can't put them by the people that are buried here. Yeah like not in space here except right there it's just i don't know it seems wrong that they don't even have a, something to let you know where they are yeah because at the end of the day they were still people that had families parents children so were they buried on property first yeah they were buried on property she said last night she thinks there could be a lot of bodies still there Dang. Why did I don't know. I think when the prison shut down, they moved them in 2000, whatever, three or four. But it just begs the question, you know, these people, the people that were executed obviously did terrible things, but did they deserve to die in such a gruesome way like the gas chamber hmm. and then be buried forever with their name and everything lost? Some do, it's a perplexed question. Some people may agree. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, it's even crazy. They, I mean, when she was taking us through the tour yesterday, she was saying that, I mean, a lot of the inmates that died, it, like, it was just kind of written down with a pencil. Uh, this guy got stabbed and then forgotten, like, thrown away. Like, no family. They're in prison for life anyway. And when they die, it's just kind of. It's just a. And remember all her attitude that was like, hey, what? But once they get hot or once they do, who cares? Yeah, they didn't care. They didn't care about anything. Even like the fire safety oh, treated, and all that stuff, they they did not care about the inmates at all. And a lot of times, prison back in the day, it wasn't, and still in some circumstances, it's not about rehabilitation. It's just about 
punishment. And, That's exactly what it is. Uh, it's sad to know that even after they die, it's almost like still a punishment that their names are just forgotten forever. That's what I mean. So what do you do, though, if it's your daughter killed by the gun? I know, that's what I'm saying. It's a right. complex question. If you talk to a family who was, their daughter was raped and brutally murdered, or three of them were killed, do they really care where this, this guy ends up? Well, that's what, you, that's what I mean. You got both sides. That's the question of humanity, though. I mean... That's the question of the death penalty in general. Yeah. Which is... We're not trying to get political here, but that's the complexity of the issue. Because they were still babies at one point. Even a serial killer still has parents and I mean, there people that people care about them. were getting them. executed on death row that were like early 20s. Yeah. And some that really aren't guilty. Yeah. yeah. I think at the end of the day, they should have at least marked where they're at. Or put a memorial or yeah, something. Yeah, like out. something saying, you know, this is where they are. Yeah. Because who knows? No one knows where they are. I'm going to assume they're down in this area wouldn't you guys yes and no they might not have anybody buried there because it's at a low point i bet water collects so. mm, it's true but then the other only real area would be kind of along the fence line i mean if they just uh, dug up the bodies and brought them out here they're probably bones anyway they yeah. probably just dug a deep hole and just buried them all together well to whoever's here if there are any former prisoners here in the cemetery. If you can hear us, obviously we don't condone what you did in life, but we're thankful you spoke with us in death. Hopefully you too found peace. Well, it's a good night, wasn't it? Very good night. Good. Pretty tired today though, huh? Mm -hmm. tired. I can Very see it in your, so. I can't see it in your eyes, but. <laughs> oh, prison Jeff. Oh, prison Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but thank you all for watching. We love you guys so much. And uh, yeah, on to the next one. Oh, here we go. Okay, perfect. perfect. I think this prison is definitely one of the most haunted locations in the United States. Um, no question about it, we were coming into contact with various different entities at this place. Not sure if we were talking to uh, prisoners or just residual kind of energy that was left behind by just all the brutality that happened in this place. This one's definitely uh, going down in my list as one of the tops. I love this place. I mean, no matter how dark that place was, but I will say that I would love to go back to this place. So the Missouri State Penitentiary has to be, I mean, just a top 10 episode for me of all time. You cannot beat a massive lightning and thunderstorm, um, rain coming down from above. It's just the spookiest thing you can possibly imagine. I live for everything spooky. Um, and then in addition, hearing things like doors slamming, the voices thumping, I mean, wow. What a crazy night. Uh, I love doing prisons just because I love history so much and with every single prison that we visit we learn about a different part of history and you know it's always dark history sadly but I think it's important that we continue to talk about that you know whether you're on the side of the death penalty or you're against the death penalty it's just really interesting to actually put yourself in the shoes of someone that was executed to sit there in that chair and think this is the last thing these people saw before they met their maker. And yeah, that sort of thing sticks with you even beyond the paranormal, just more of a, a psychological effect that it has on a person. But as always, guys, we love you so much. Thank you for tuning in this week. We will see you next week with another amazing episode from this series. It's Colin here. Stay spooky, and uh, we'll see you next time.
Hello! <laughs>